Our vast universe is home to phenomena such as star-devouring black holes, rapidly rotating pulsars, radiant nebulae birthing stars, and countless galaxies. Yet it may not be endless. There could be a distinct edge, a cosmic boundary. Let's embark on a journey to that possible frontier. Visualize the universe as a massive layered structure. At its core is Earth, enveloped by our solar system, which is in turn housed inside a galaxy within this grand universe. As we journey beyond our solar system, passing by the planets from Mars to Neptune, we encounter the heliosphere. Here, the solar wind's velocity plunges dramatically, giving way to the near-stagnant wind at the heliopause. Beyond, the ship faces the force of the interstellar wind. Two remarkable emissaries from Earth, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, now reside in this region. They revealed the heliosphere's uneven shape. Venturing further, an asteroid belt known as the Oort Cloud becomes visible, believed by some scientists to source Earth-bound comets. Beyond lies the expansive Milky Way, spanning around 106,000 light-years. Guiding our journey is a cosmic map, identifying our location in the Lanikia supercluster. However, there's more. At a greater scale, the Hydra Centaurus supercluster emerges. At the universe's maximum observable scale, a surprising revelation awaits, evidence suggesting a universe boundary. This edge, located an astounding 10 billion light years away, is a testament to time and evolution. During such a lengthy voyage, our sun might wither or explode, and the Milky Way might merge with the Andromeda Galaxy. Our endpoint is the Eridanus Supervoid, a vast empty stretch spanning a billion light years. This void might result from an unfathomable collision, our universe meeting another. This leads to a tantalizing notion of multiple universes, where every choice leads to alternate outcomes in parallel realities. Imagine our universe as a bubble. Eons ago, another bubble universe brushed against ours. Their gravitational interplay caused cosmic distortions. As they separated, a piece of our universe might have been taken, leading to the creation of the Eridanus Supervoid. Eridanus Supervoid covers a region of space about one billion light years in size. This makes it one of the largest known voids in the universe. The superwave is associated with the so-called cold spot in the cosmic microwave background radiation. The temperature in this spot is lower than the average temperature of the background radiation. The exact origin and nature of Eridanus supervoid is still a subject of research. This object provides scientists with a unique opportunity to study the structure and evolution of the universe on large scales. Yet, perceiving the universe's entirety remains a challenge. Like an ant on a basketball, we see a consistent horizon due to our 3D viewpoint. But adding dimensions could change our perceptions. Could black holes, with their powerful gravitational influence, offer a passage to these other realms? The vast expanse of our universe is filled with intriguing structures, mysteries, and phenomena that continually challenge our understanding of the cosmos. The Eridanus Supervoid, with its immense size and enigmatic nature, stands as a testament to the universe's capacity to astonish and confound us. And for those intrigued by the enigmatic nature of black holes, we invite you to explore more in our other videos. Dive deep into the mysteries of these cosmic giants and join us on a journey of understanding and wonder. Have you ever heard about the Big Bang? I bet you have. So the history of the universe and its evolution is widely known as the Big Bang model. It claims that our universe began as an insanely hot and dense speck about 13.7 billion years ago. But how did it go all the way from a tiny point to the ginormous world we see and don't see today? We're about to figure that out. Despite its name, the Big Bang wasn't a powerful space explosion. It was the appearance of space everywhere in the universe at once. And the universe itself was born as a very dense single spot in space. No one knows for sure what was before this moment, but scientists are working on figuring it out. 
Their main assistant is the cosmic microwave background, which still contains the afterglow of the radiation and light left after the Big Bang. Eventually, it may help scientists piece together some clues about the early universe. Just like any kid, when the universe was very young, about a hundredth of a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, it experienced an unbelievable growth spurt. Known as inflation, this burst allowed the universe to double in size at least 90 times. As the universe was expanding, it was also getting cooler and less dense. After the insane growth burst, it kept growing, but at a much slower rate. Very soon, the universe cooled down enough for matter to start forming. Everything happened so fast at that time. Light chemical elements appeared within the first three minutes after the formation of the universe. Protons and neutrons began to collide, producing deuterium, an isotope of hydrogen. A lot of this deuterium combined and created helium. Then, the process is slowed down significantly, but still for the first 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the intense heat from the creation of the universe made it too hot even for light to shine. The conditions in this early universe were hellish. Atoms collided with such force that they broke into an opaque plasma of electrons, protons, and neutrons. This dense veil scattered light like fog. But 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the matter eventually cooled down enough for electrons to connect with nuclei and form neutral atoms. This absorption of free electrons finally made the universe transparent. By the way, the light unleashed at that time can still be detected today in the form of radiation. A period of darkness followed this era called the Era of Recombination. And then, stars and other bright objects started to form. It happened about 400 million years after the Big Bang. This next period got the name Reionization. Some time ago, scientists thought that it had lasted more than half a billion years, but new evidence hints that it might have occurred more rapidly than we thought. During this period, clumps of gas collided and created the first galaxies and stars. These events emitted ultraviolet light, which got rid of most of the surrounding neutral hydrogen gas. That's why we call those times the period of reionization. This process led to the universe becoming transparent to ultraviolet light for the first time. At the moment, astronomers are combing the universe in search of the farthest and oldest galaxies. Such a discovery can help us understand the properties of the early universe. It's like working backwards to piece together the events that happened before. That's what researchers are doing now by studying the cosmic microwave background. Our solar system was born around 9 billion years after the Big Bang, which makes it around 4.6 billion years old. As far as we know, our Sun, orbiting approximately 25,000 light-years from the galactic center, is one of more than 100 billion stars in our home Milky Way galaxy. The most popular idea is that the Sun, as well as the rest of our solar system, was once formed from a huge rotating cloud of space dust and gas known as a nebula. At one point, gravity caused this nebula to collapse. It started spinning faster and, eventually, flattened into a disk. Most of the material that made up the nebula got pulled towards the center of this formation, and that's how the Sun was born. At one point, scientists started thinking that there might be more mass in the universe than what we see. After some research, the concept of dark matter appeared. One theory stated that this mysterious stuff could be formed by some exotic particles. They don't interact with regular matter or light. That's why it's so difficult to detect them. Already in the 1920s, astronomers made an astounding discovery. Apparently, the universe isn't static. It's constantly expanding. Interestingly, when decades later, in 1998, the Hubble Space Telescope studied distant supernova, it became obvious that in the past, the universe was expanding more slowly than today. Why was this discovery so confusing? Because it was long believed that the gravity of matter making up the universe would slow down the expansion process, or even cause the universe to contract. That's why these days the concept has changed a bit. Everything on Earth and everything people have managed to see in space with the help of telescopes and other instruments is normal matter. 
It's made up of atoms and molecules and adds up to less than 5% of the universe. Around 27% of the universe is dark matter and almost three-fourths of the universe is dark energy. Astronomers wouldn't even know the thing existed if, several decades ago, they hadn't found out that the expansion of the universe wasn't slowing down. Quite the opposite, it was accelerating. It meant that there had to be some enigmatic force counteracting gravity. It got dubbed dark energy. The European Space Agency's Planck satellite helped astronomers calculate how much dark energy the universe has to contain to explain the way its expansion is constantly speeding up. Scientists have also built models of how many giant stars formed and collapsed into black holes since the beginning of the universe. The conclusion is very exciting. The vacuum energy in these black holes is almost the same as the amount of dark energy that should exist in the universe. And still, even though nowadays we know much more about the universe than we used to, there are still important questions that remain unanswered. And, of course, dark matter and dark energy remain the biggest mysteries. Another one is whether something existed before the universe was born, or maybe the theory of the false vacuum is correct. It says that our universe exists in a false phase state, which means it's just a temporary thing. What's more, it's only part of a larger universe. If you compare this larger universe with a kettle full of boiling water, the universe we live in will be just a tiny bubble on the surface of the water. But this can't keep going endlessly. One day, perhaps in billions of years, this false vacuum will burst. And then the visible universe around us will instantly vanish with a pop. There won't be any preliminary warning and we'll have to somehow deal with it. In any case, astronomers are working hard to find the answers to these burning questions. The James Webb Telescope launched in 2021 is believed to be the very tool that can help us to peer back to the beginning of time and explore the evolution of the universe with the help of its infrared instruments. By observing the universe at infrared wavelength, James Webb lets us see things no other telescope has ever shown before. The primary goal of this incredible piece of equipment is to study the formation of galaxies and stars that formed in the early universe. To look that far back in time, we need to look deeper into space. All because it takes light time to travel from there to us. So the farther we look, the further we glimpse back in time. To find the first galaxies, James Webb is going to make an ultra-deep near-infrared survey of the universe. The universe is believed to have started around 14 billion years ago with a big bang. And as far as we know, it hasn't stopped expanding since then. But if it's so, the universe must have started somewhere, right? And there has to be the center of the universe somewhere out there. Well, experts claim there's no center of the universe. Neither is there any center of the expansion. It's the same everywhere. You see, it's wrong to imagine the Big Bang as an ordinary explosion. And the universe does not expand from the center outward. Instead, as far as we know, the universe is expanding equally in all places. In 1929, Edwin Hubble said he had managed to measure the speed of galaxies that were located at different distances from Earth. He discovered that the farther they were, the faster they were moving away from us. Does it mean we are at the center of the expanding universe? Unlikely. It just means that the universe is expanding at the same rate everywhere. And wherever you are, it will seem to you that you're at the center of the universe. Now, about that Big Bang. If you watched a regular explosion in slow-mo, you'd see material expanding out from a central point. Right after the explosion, the center remains the hottest point. Later, a spherical shell of material starts growing, moving away from the center of the explosion. The process continues until gravity stops this expansion. But the Big Bang was nothing like that. It was an explosion of space, not an explosion in space. According to the most common theory, there was no before to speak of, no space and no time. It means that the Big Bang was very different from anything we're used to and doesn't have any central point. 
Even if we had been able to observe it in real life, we wouldn't have seen an expanding edge with empty space beyond it. The only thing we can detect now is a faint background glow. It was left by the hot primordial gases that existed in the early universe. This is called cosmic background radiation, and it's uniform in all directions. It can mean only one thing. It's not matter moving outward from one point, but space itself expanding evenly. At the same time, the idea that the universe is expanding uniformly in all directions doesn't rule out the possibility that somewhere out there, there's a denser and hotter place that might be called the center of the universe. But as far as we can see, there's no sign of such a special point. The theory that the universe should be uniform is known as the cosmological principle. It appeared in 1933. Not so long before that, some scientists believed that the universe only consisted of our home galaxy. If this was the case, we could definitely consider the center of the Milky Way to be the center of the universe. But in 1924, Hubble put an end to that debate. He showed there were other galaxies besides our own. But in any case, how we see the universe is limited by the speed of light and the finite time since the Big Bang occurred. Even though the observable part of the universe is very large, it's likely tiny in comparison to the entire universe, which may be infinite. The universe might have many shapes, with or without an identifiable center. And if it turned out to have a center outside of the observable universe, this point, or region of space, could be just one of many. It could be just like the center of our galaxy, which was considered to be the center of the universe before. Look at the sky. You can choose any direction, and still, the limits of what you can see extend to astronomical distances. The most ancient light we can observe was emitted a mind-boggling 13.8 billion years ago. This date corresponds to the Big Bang itself. That's why the following fact may sound so confusing. When, after traveling through the expanding universe, light arrives on Earth, it provides us with information about objects currently located around 46.1 billion light-years away. It's only possible because of the expanding fabric of space. That's how the most ancient light we can see corresponds to distances much greater than 13.8 billion light-years. With time, we'll be able to see even farther away since light that's still on its way will finally reach us. And still, at any given time, there will be a limit to how far we can see. That's the limit to the observable universe. It also means that at any point in the past, the universe had a finite size too, and it was smaller than today, depending on how much time had passed since the Big Bang. Okay, but what would we see if we went all the way back to the beginning? To the moment of the Big Bang? Surprisingly, it wouldn't be a singularity, with the universe having infinite density and temperature at a barely perceptible size. No there would be a limit, and it would be the smallest size the universe could have had. Let's find out together why such a limit must exist, and how tiny the early universe could actually be. If you want to know anything about what our universe will do in the future, or did in the past, you need to figure out the rules and laws it follows. And all of them are set forth by the theory of general relativity, which claims that what we perceive as the force of gravity comes from the curvature of space and time. One more thing to remember is that the universe is both isotropic, having the same properties in all directions we look, and homogeneous, having the same properties in all places we could go to. But if the universe has the same properties in all places and all directions, it means that it must either expand or contract. Let's say you know its expansion rate at the moment, then you can determine the size of the observable universe at any moment of the past or future its expansion rate at any point in the past or future, and how energetically important each component of the universe was or will be in the past or future. And by these components, we mean radiation, normal matter, dark matter, neutrinos, dark energy, and so on. To figure out what our universe did in the past or will do in the future, we need to understand how every component evolves with time and when and under what circumstances these components transform into one another. According to the theory of cosmic inflation, the universe was once filled with large amounts of energy. It was similar to dark energy, 
but much greater in magnitude. It made the universe expand faster and faster. As a result, the universe was getting colder and emptier. And then, after growing this way for a very long, possibly infinite amount of time, most of this energy got converted into matter and radiation, which triggered the Big Bang. Now, about the size of the universe. Today, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, the universe is 46.1 billion light years across. When matter started to dominate radiation, which happened when the universe was around 10,000 years old, the size of the universe was about 10 million light years. When the universe was three years old, it was roughly the size of the Milky Way galaxy. When the universe was just one year old, it was both smaller than our home galaxy and unbelievably hot, hot enough to start nuclear fusion. And when the universe was a mere one second old, it was too hot for nuclear fusion to occur. Its radius was just 10 light years, which is still enough to enclose nine nearest star systems we know about. And if we somehow managed to observe the universe when it was just a trillionth of a second old, we'd see that it was the size of Earth's orbit around the sun. The universe is expanding, and if it's expanding, then it probably had a beginning somewhere. Now, all we have to do is to run time backward and see where the beginning was. It took the scientists many more years to come up with a full-fledged theory. The Big Bang Theory. And here it is. Nothing has ever been anywhere, because neither when nor where existed. But actually, no. There was one thing. It was the so-called cosmic singularity, a state of our universe in which it was incredibly small, dense, and very, very hot. Imagine if our universe was compressed into a small ball. The pressure and temperature inside would be enormous. At some point, it became impossible to withstand them. And here comes the Big Bang. It was an outburst of energy and matter that created everything we see now. Time and space, basic physical forces. It also scattered quarks everywhere. These quarks, tiny particles that make up our world, were all boiling in an incredibly hot cosmic broth. When it cooled down, gravity began to attract them to each other. They gathered into atoms, then molecules, and then into the first objects in the world. Stars. But what was before that? Alan Harvey Guth, an American theoretical physicist and cosmologist, has devoted his whole life to solving this mystery. After learning about the Big Bang Theory, Guth found some flaws in it. For example, the distribution of matter was very even, although it shouldn't have been. If we drop the balloon filled with paint down, it will burst, and we'll see absolute chaos on the canvas. But the early universe don't look like. The early universe was very even and proportional. That was Guth's discovery, the theory of inflation. Here's what it says, even before the Big Bang, there was some kind of force that could give the bang a strong acceleration, something that was able to distribute everything in space instantly and evenly. Martin Boyovald is a German professor of physics, and in his opinion, the universe was born quite differently. According to Martin's theory, the singularity couldn't just appear out of nowhere. Let's look at a pendulum on the old clock. The pendulum rotates back and forth, its movement is smooth, continuous, and non-stop. This is how we usually see time. It flows and never stops. But quantum time doesn't work that way. It consists of small segments and makes short pauses. And just like with the second hand of a clock, the beginning of one segment of time is always the end of another. According to the Big Bang Theory, once upon a time, our universe began to expand inflate like a balloon. But sooner or later, it will blow away back. The universe will start shrinking and return to the state of cosmic singularity. And then, the Big Bang too. Nothing appears out of nowhere and disappears into nowhere. According to Boyovald's theory, the beginning of each universe is the end of the previous one. Our universe is not at all the first and not the last. Millions of similar universes existed before us and will exist after us. This theory, although it sounds very logical, is far from complete. So for now, all this is just a hypothesis. But some people come up with even stranger ideas. Neil Turok, a South African physicist, 
and his colleague Paul Steinhardt, an American theoretical physicist. They say that yes, our universe isn't the first one. Our universe is just one of an infinite number of others. And all of us are stuck in a cycle of endless rebirths of parallel worlds. According to this theory, our universe is located inside a so-called brain, as in membrane. In other words, we're stuck in some kind of elastic surface that's capable of contracting, stretching, oscillating, and so on. Like pieces of fabric on a rope. Another universe may be an inch from ours, but we can't see it. That's because there's a tiny space between us, and this tiny space contains the fourth dimension. How do these universes originate? Through brain collision. These brains are getting closer to each other very, very slowly, until they finally collide. Their collision creates two big bangs and two parallel universes. Then they're moving away from each other. The created worlds continue to live. We're currently at this stage. Remember the inflation theory? There was a mysterious energy that pushed and accelerated the Big Bang. Well, if we did collide with another universe, that would explain everything. Which idea is closer to you? How about the idea of subscribing? Subscribe. You're traveling through deep space, circling stars and entire galaxies. Whoa, looks like this multicolored nebula will soon collapse under its own weight and explode like a supernova. Now let's carefully circle this black hole. Try not to get caught in its gravitational field, or it'll swallow you like a space monster. Hmm, wait, what's that strange structure right there? It's a glowing wall. And if you look closely, each glowing dot is an entire galaxy. That wall has about 100,000 of these galaxies. The Milky Way has 100 billion stars. So this wall holds a quadrillion, that's 10 followed by 15 zeros, of stars like our sun. This giant structure is called the South Pole Wall. It's located about 500 million light years from Earth. By comparison, the closest star to our home is Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.2 light years away. Rockets can cover that distance in about 73,000 years. So the journey to the South Pole Wall may take longer than our solar system exists. And this wall is simply gigantic, even on a cosmic scale. It's about 1.37 billion light years long. To give you an idea of how large that is, the Milky Way is only 100,000 light years wide. But you can't see this wall even with the most powerful telescope. The problem is that the Milky Way itself obstructs your view. It's so bright that it's hiding this wall. It's like trying to look at the starry sky in a metropolis. The light pollution won't let you do that. Scientists have been able to detect this galactic wall by measuring redshift. We know that all objects in the universe are moving. They spread out from each other as a result of the Big Bang, which happened billions of years ago. And when galaxies move, their light waves change slightly. By measuring this change, we can understand what the object is and how it moves. And this wall isn't even the largest in our universe. This is the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall. It's a giant flat superstructure about 10 billion light years wide. That's around 10% of the entire observable universe. And it's also a wall, that is a cluster of galaxies. We were able to detect this giant structure by gamma ray bursts. It's the brightest electromagnetic event in the universe. You could even see it in the far reaches of our universe. Such bursts are a very rare event. In the Milky Way, for example, it happens once every few million years. If we notice many such bursts in a short time from the same place, it means that there are many objects like the Milky Way in that place. So, there are a lot of galaxies out there. Another unusual giant structure in the universe is the huge, large quasar group. It's about 4 billion light years across. So it takes a photon of light almost as long as our planet has existed just to get from one side of the structure to the other. And if you put the huge, large quasar group on the scale, it would be 6.1 billion billion times heavier than our sun. Scientists have found that there are at least 73 quasars in that structure. These are some of the most unusual objects in the universe. They are the active cores of galaxies. At the center of a quasar is a supermassive black hole. This giant eats up the matter around it. A wild force of gravity twists the matter around the black hole, forming a disk. 
and this disk is the source of the strongest radiation out there. By comparison, the radiation from a single quasar is tens or hundreds of times stronger than that of all the stars in our galaxy put together. Because of such strong radiation, we can detect quasars even at very long distances. That's why they're also called beacons of the universe. Scientists use quasars to study the universe and the movement within it. One of the most distant quasars from us is about 13.1 billion light years away. This makes it one of the oldest objects in the universe. It appeared about 690 million years after the Big Bang, and it's almost three times older than our solar system. It's still glowing with extreme brightness, about 4 and 14 zeros times brighter than the sun. Scientists explain that at the center of the giant is a supermassive black hole, 800 million times heavier than the sun. All these giant structures are just building blocks of our universe. Look, this is our solar system. Now, zoom out a little, and this is where our home star is in the Milky Way galaxy. Zoom out again. Here's a local group of galaxies. All the bright spots here are galaxies. Here's Andromeda. And here's the Triangulum galaxy, plus a few dozen other slightly smaller galaxies. They're all gravitationally connected. The size of this structure is about 10 million light years. That's 100 times the width of our galaxy. Zoom out, please. This one is the Virgo supercluster. It's 20 times larger than the local group. There are about 30,000 different galaxies. And the mass of the whole thing is about 1 in 15 zeros solar masses. Zoom out again. Lanaya Kia. This structure is almost three times larger. It includes the Virgo supercluster and other smaller clusters. And there are about 100,000 galaxies here. Huh, it's not over yet. Zoom out one more time. Here's the Pisces Cetus supercluster complex. This giant galactic structure contains about 60 clusters of galaxies. So there are more galaxies in it than grains of sand in the desert. You know what to do. Zoom out. Phew, this is the observable universe. There are over 500 billion galaxies. And the stars? Well, there are about 1 billion trillion stars. The observable universe has its own structure. Clusters of galaxies form chains and walls, as you've seen before. But these strands are separated by huge regions of absolute emptiness. These areas are called voids. In these places, there is no matter at all. There are fewer molecules in the voids than in an empty room. One of these voids has a very mystical reputation. It's the Eridnus supervoid, or the cold spot. It appeared here only 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It's almost 1 billion light years wide and could hold hundreds or thousands of galaxies with trillions of stars. Some scientists believe that this cold spot may have been the result of the largest collision ever. A collision of universes. There's a theory that our universe is some kind of bubble, a huge sphere that contains all these walls and chains of galaxies. Now imagine that there's an infinite number of these bubbles. They could be parallel worlds or different universes. Many years ago, one bubble came close to the bubble of our universe. Their walls touched and the two universes connected for a while. It's like two drops of water coming together. But that universe kept moving. The area where the bubbles joined became thinner and thinner until that connection broke and the two bubbles detached from each other. At this point, the second universe ripped some of the material out of our bubble. All those galaxies that used to fill the Eridanus supervoid ended up in a parallel universe. Scientists supposed we might travel through other bubbles. Flying to the supposed wall of our universe would take forever. And then it would take even longer to fly through interuniversal space. So we have to use portals or wormholes. Here's how it works. Imagine a piece of paper with point A on one side and point B on the other. Instead of moving all the way across the sheet of paper, we just fold the sheet so that point A is right above point B. All that's left to do is make a small hole, and the journey takes only moments. Some scientists believe that such shortcuts through universes lie inside black holes. But how do you survive falling into a black hole? You just have to pick one that's big enough. It's all about gravity. Imagine you're falling into a black hole right now. The closer you get to it, the stronger effect it has on you. It intensifies with every inch. At one point, the gravitational force that affects your head is much stronger than the one that affects your feet. 
Then you turn into spaghetti. Yum. But if you choose a supermassive black hole, like the ones at the centers of galaxies, the gravitational force in them increases gradually. They can be millions of times heavier than the sun and much bigger. But the gravitational force on your head and your feet will be almost equal, and you will still feel comfortable. Who knows? Maybe if you manage to survive a fall into such a massive black hole, you'd find yourself in a completely different universe where different laws of physics apply. But so far, this is just a theory. There are a lot of unanswered questions in physics. How did universal energy and matter appear? Where did gravity come from? And much more. We've been trying for years to get answers to these questions. And one of the people who tried to do this was Paramahamsa Tiwari, the author of the so-called Space Vortex Theory. What is this theory? And what does it say about the hidden laws of our universe? Let's figure it out. Paramahamsa Tiwari was the former executive director of the Nuclear Power Corporation, India. He took the Space Vortex Theory, or SVT for short, first proposed by René Descartes and finalized it. He was always inspired by physics and its greats, even since his days as an electrical engineering student. After rigorous studies of the laws of physics, he discovered new equations defining matter and the mass and charge of the electron. After that, he came up with the SVT. This theory tried to explain the unexplained phenomena in physics, including the creation of the electron and gravitational, electrostatic, and electromagnetic energy fields, as well as other things. It also described the six hidden laws of the universe that underlie our entire world. But first of all, let's talk about the theory itself. Space vortex theory suggests that the universe is made up of vortices, or swirling patterns of energy. And according to SVT, these vortices are the fundamental building blocks of the universe. They're the driving force behind the laws of physics and the fundamental principles of our world. Basically, everything in the universe is connected and interconnected through these vortices. This theory isn't very based on any real observations, but rather on mathematical models and computational modeling. For example, some computational models showed how these vortices work in hydrodynamics and plasma physics. They showed that vortices in such systems can have a central point of attraction and can be interconnected. Other models were used to study how the energies inside the vortices move and how they can create different frequencies and vibrations. But some experts have criticized SVT for using only models and simulations. The biggest criticism is that this theory can't actually be tested. It relies on mathematics and not on some experimental data. That's why it's not accepted as a mainstream scientific theory. But it's still quite interesting and provides a unique perspective on the universe and our understanding of the laws of physics. For example, according to SVT, the universe has some underlying, hidden rules that cause the creation of fundamental matter, their assembly, and movement. What are these laws and what do they say? Well, let's take a look at them. Law 1. The universe has only one primordial entity, space, i.e. absolute vacuum, that structures matter. This law states that space is the fundamental building block of the universe and that it's responsible for structuring matter. It suggests that space is the fundamental entity that creates and maintains the structure of matter and that all matter in the universe is made up of the same fundamental particles like electrons and positrons. Let's try to put it in simple words. Imagine that the universe is like a big Lego set. Just like how all the Lego bricks are made up of the same basic building blocks, the universe is made up of the same fundamental building blocks too. And these blocks are called electrons and positrons. But what holds these blocks together? Space, of course. Space gives it shape and structure, just like how the plastic container holds all the Lego bricks together in a set. So, the first law states that space is the fundamental building block that structures matter and holds everything together in the universe. Law 2. Matter is constituted with multiples of only one kind of fundamental particles, electrons and positrons. 
This law states that all matter in the universe is made up of the same fundamental particles, the electron and positron. These two are the Lego blocks we've talked about before. And according to the second law, these tiny invisible particles make up everything from a tiny atom to a giant galaxy. Just like no matter what the shape or size our Lego build is, it's still made up of the same building blocks. Law 3. The field distribution in space, as recognized by contemporary physics, linked with and emanating from matter, are effects arising from only one fundamental field in space. This law states that the fields recognized by contemporary physics, such as the electromagnetic and gravitational fields, are effects arising from a single fundamental field in space. It suggests that this fundamental field is responsible for creating everything that we observe in the universe. So let's try to put it simply. This time, imagine that the universe is like a big playground. All the different fields we observe, such as the gravitational and electromagnetic fields, are like different games we play in there. But no matter what we play, we're still in one fundamental space. This is the playground itself. It's the base that holds everything together. According to the third law, without the playground, we wouldn't be able to play any games. And without this fundamental field in space, we wouldn't be able to observe any fields in the universe. Law 4. There is no void in space anywhere in the whole universe except at the centers of the fundamental particles of matter, electrons and positrons. This law states that there's no truly empty space in the universe and that all space is filled with the fundamental field, the one we talked about before. It says that electrons and positrons can be found everywhere and even the things we consider to be empty, like vacuum, are actually full of tiny particles. And according to this law, the only truly empty spaces we can find in the universe are at the centers of the fundamental particles, electrons and positrons. Law 5. From only one fundamental universal constant, all the constants considered universal in contemporary physics are derivable. This law states that all the constants considered universal in contemporary physics can be derived from a single fundamental universal constant. It suggests that all the constants in physics are interconnected and can be explained by a single fundamental principle. I know you've been doing a lot of imagining lately, but bear with me. This time, please imagine the universe as a big recipe. All the constants in physics, such as the speed of light, the gravitational constant and the Planck constant are like the ingredients. They're very different and there are tons of them. But just like how all the ingredients in a recipe are interconnected and come together to make one dish, all the constants in physics come together to make the universe. And just like how a recipe has a main ingredient that holds everything together, physics also has a single fundamental constant that holds everything together. Law 6. The spatial structure of submicrocosmic fundamental matter is repetitive uniformly in the spatial structures of macrocosmic bodies like planets, stars, and galaxies. This law states that the structure of the fundamental particles that make up matter is repetitive and uniform across all scales, from subatomic particles to macrocosmic bodies like planets, stars, and galaxies. It suggests that the same fundamental principles govern the structure of matter at all scales. Let's go back to the analogy with the recipes and cooking. Using different ingredients and combining them in different ways, the chef can create new dishes. These will all be different dishes and they can be very simple or very complex. But when creating them, the chef still applies the same basic rules and knowledge they have, right? And just like that, the universe also creates different structures, from atoms to planets, stars and galaxies. But it still uses the same fundamental principles to create all these things. So, this law suggests that the structure of the fundamental particles that make up matter is repetitive and uniform across all scales. These are the six fundamental laws of the universe according to the SVT. And even though it's not accepted by mainstream science, it's still a pretty interesting concept.
In the universe, wonders are never in short supply, and each one tells us a story about time, space, and our place among the stars. One such tale revolves around our closest celestial neighbor, the moon. This enigmatic satellite, accompanying Earth for billions of years, has captivated human attention throughout the ages. From the first shamans worshipping the moon to modern-day scientists probing its surface, it remains a key to understanding our past, present, and perhaps future. Here's the sun. It's in the center of our solar system. Mercury, Venus, and here's Earth and the moon. The Earth takes 365 days to orbit around the star. At the same time, the moon revolves around the Earth and completely orbits our planet in 27 days. The Earth creates a shadow zone, and sometimes the moon passes through it. The shadow is cone-shaped and gradually narrows. The moon is 238,000 miles away. That's like nine lengths of the equator. At this distance, the width of the shadow is about 2.6 times the width of the moon. When the moon is in this zone, direct sunlight doesn't reach it. That is, it should have disappeared, but instead it becomes red. All because the sun's rays pass through the Earth's atmosphere. They scatter and most of the blue light disappears. But the red and orange rays continue and hit the surface of the moon. Voila! You see a phenomenon called the blood moon. By the way, this curvature of light occurs at sunsets and dawns. The atmosphere scatters the blue light and you see a red and orange sky. If you were standing on the surface of the moon during a total lunar eclipse, planet Earth would be exactly between you and the sun, so you would be able to observe the solar eclipse. The surface of the Earth would become entirely dark for you. All you'd see would be the sun's corona illuminating the edges of the planet. The Earth from the surface of the moon is almost the same size as the moon from the surface of the Earth. Such a red eclipse of the moon is rare because several factors must coincide. One of them is that the moon must be full. Usually, you can see two total lunar eclipses a year. In 2038, you'll be able to see four such eclipses, and the eclipse itself can last up to 108 minutes. But this is rare, and the last time such a long blood moon was seen was in 2000. Many years ago, people didn't know so many facts about our satellite, and the sight of a red moon frightened them. It was a bad sign and a harbinger of trouble. People who knew the schedule of eclipses could take advantage of it. For example, Christopher Columbus had an astronomical almanac and knew when the next lunar eclipse would occur. He frightened the inhabitants of the Caribbean islands when he predicted the red moon. The moon is gravitationally locked with the Earth. That's why it is always turned to us with one side, like Mercury in the sun. But the moon doesn't stand still. It's gradually moving away from our planet. About 1.5 in a year. Not quickly. But in about 600 million years, it will have shrunk in our sky so much that we won't be able to see lunar eclipses anymore. Do you see this crater? It's Tycho. It's visible during a full moon because of these bright rays that extend thousands of miles from its epicenter. This is the youngest crater on the moon. Scientists say it appeared there due to a meteorite impact about 109 million years ago. At that time, dinosaurs were roaming the surface of our planet, and they may have seen the impact. It was most likely accompanied by a big explosion and looked like a salute in the night sky. In wrapping up, our relationship with the moon is a testament to the beauty and mystery of our universe. Its patterns, movements, and influence on Earth serve as a reminder of the grand cosmic dance we're a part of. If you're intrigued by such celestial wonders, do consider subscribing for more insights into our incredible universe. Look at these two pictures. At first glance, one might think, well, aren't they showing the exact same thing? Truth is, they don't. But both these subjects are some of the most complex structures humans have ever had the chance to study. The first image shows a cluster of galaxies from our universe. The second is just a small neuron in the human brain. After seeing these images, some were quick to compare them. Is the universe nothing more than a huge brain? Now let's not get too excited. Before we go into describing all the similarities between the universe and the human brain, there is something we need to be aware of. It's a little thing called apophenia. 
And it's when our brains make up similarities between two objects that are seriously unrelated. The best example is when we look at clouds and start to see all sorts of cute animals and weirdly shaped objects. We might be doing the same thing when looking at those two initial pictures. Maybe it's just our brain making up similarities where there aren't any. Some scientists became fascinated with this huge brain universe idea. They wanted to make sure it was not just a weird coincidence. There had to be a way they could measure how the universe compares to the mushy organ inside our heads. So they started with the brain. It's probably one of the most complicated things we know in the whole universe. That's because it's packed with more than 80 billion neurons. These cells are responsible for taking information from our senses and sending out messages all over our body. Try to think of neurons as workers in a factory. They don't just do their work, they actually communicate with each other, thanks to these elements called axons and dendrites. The axons are responsible for carrying electrical signals away from the neuron's body to other neurons or muscles. Dendrites, on the other hand, have the task of receiving that information. All of them together make this mega network of about 100 trillion connections. The universe is one big social network itself, too. But this time, it's made up of galaxies. You might picture the universe as stars and planets with a ton of empty space between them. It's not quite right. What we can see and measure is known as the observable universe, and it's really vast. Think about 90 billion light years across containing hundreds of billions to maybe a few trillion of galaxies. These galaxies, like the one we're standing in at this very moment, are bundled together in groups. Our Milky Way is friends, in a way, with galaxies like Andromeda and Triangulum. And altogether, they're a family called the Local Group. This family of galaxies is part of an even bigger bunch called the Virgo Supercluster. From what we can tell, the space between them might not be empty. It's filled with these threads made up of regular matter, but there might also be this mysterious dark matter doing its thing. Scientists didn't stop there. They decided to take it a bit further. They started by examining thin slices of the human cortex, the part responsible for our thoughts, memories, and even our consciousness. The next step was to compare them with equally thin slices of the universe from a computer simulation. Now it's obvious there's this enormous size difference between the brain and the universe. But the way they looked at it kind of made them somewhat comparable. As they zoomed in, think 40 times magnification, these scientists began noticing that the structures were very much alike. At this zoom, the brain's neural network looked like the universe's galaxy clusters. To make sure they weren't just imagining things, they used two clever methods. The first one looked at how these networks connected and how densely packed they were. They noticed that the middle part of a neuron, or its nucleus, is way tinier compared to its connecting fragments. Likewise, galaxy clusters are tiny when you look at the super long connecting threads between them. The second method was about checking how organized these networks were versus just being random. They looked at how everything was structured around each connection point, whether it was a neuron in the brain or a galaxy cluster in the universe. The resemblance doesn't stop there. We know that our brain is mostly water, about 70% to be precise. Now the cosmic web in space, it too has about 70% of something, only this time it's dark energy. Water and dark energy may not be the most important elements in each of their structures, but they might still play a part in how everything sets up. The analogy continues. You see, the space we'd need on a computer to map out the universe is almost the same as our brain's memory storage. Somewhere in the ballpark of 2.5 petabytes. So theoretically, a chunk of the universe could fit in our brains. Or flip that, and our entire life's memories could get stored in the universe's network. There are differences too, and we have to be aware of them to make sure we're assessing things properly. For starters, the universe is pretty much the same all over. It doesn't change its composition that much, regardless of where you travel in the observable area. But our brain, not so much. Different parts have different jobs. Also, 
our brain connections send information depending on things like what you're seeing or touching. On the flip side, the universe's links are just energy. There's also a difference between how these two structures came to be. It turns out that the patterns we see when we're gazing up at the stars are all shaped by gravity and some weird unseen force called dark matter. Massive fireworks in space called supernovae can also affect this cosmic wallpaper. On the opposite side of the spectrum, our brains got their shape from evolution. That long process where animals, including us, get to pass on the best features and data they've learned to their offspring. So, if a trait like a certain shape of the brain helped our ancestors dodge a hungry tiger, that trait got passed down. Our brains are also built the way they are because they're supposed to act like a superhighway for our thoughts. Quick thinking was crucial for people back in the day when they needed shelter from wild animals or the elements. Now, especially if you're a fan of sci-fi literature, you might be wondering, if the universe is like this immense brain, what might its body look like? We might as well be living in someone else's head. We like to think of humans as evolved, intelligent, and at times, hard to understand creatures. But what if we're just tiny neurons in a larger, more complex structure? Well, for the time being, we can only let our imaginations run wild. There's no way we can test at this point what's outside our universe. By all means, we don't even know how large it is. By looking at the parts we can see, the estimations are that the universe is about 95 billion light years in diameter. Even if we'd somehow manage to travel at the speed of light, though that seems a bit impossible at the moment too, it would take an enormous amount of time to reach those supposed edges of the universe. There's also the theory of the multiverse. We don't have much tangible proof of this idea either, but it does claim we live in a universe out of many. Ours has time and space. Other worlds may have different rules and components. Life may look differently out there in ways we can't even understand. Having a better understanding of the universe is just as important as figuring out our brains. You see, we still have many unsolved mysteries right here under our noses or behind our noses to be more precise. There are a lot of things we've yet to figure out about the human brain, like how we store and retrieve memories. We know that each time we learn some new piece of information, our brain changes. But we don't have the entire process mapped out, and it looks like it might take a while before we fully understand it. Imagine the universe as a gigantic, elastic balloon that's steadily being inflated. That's what dark energy seems to be doing, forcing galaxies further apart. Could this force lead to the end of the universe? Some scientists do think so, and they've named this potential event the Big Rip. It's challenging to study dark energy, even though it's one of the most fascinating aspects of our cosmos. That's because its only visible effect is this gentle stretching of space. On any smaller scale, it's virtually undetectable. Compared to dark energy, studying dark matter feels like a walk in the park. Even though it's just as invisible, dark matter leaves clear evidence of its existence. It latches onto galaxies and galaxy clusters, bending light and altering gravity. Dark energy, on the flip side, just expands. Nonetheless, scientists have found ways to examine it, mostly by observing the universe's expansion. As we peer into the distance, we are, in fact, peering back in time, tracing the universe's evolution. Dark energy could also bring about the end of the universe in a massive, catastrophic event. Imagine watching helplessly as reality itself tears apart with no hope of escape. Frighteningly, it's not some far-fetched scenario. The available data does not eliminate the possibility of a big rip. Is dark energy a force that keeps inflating the universe, or is it more like a separator? If two galaxies are far away from each other, they're driven further apart, leading to increasing cosmic isolation. But anything that's already a strong structure stays intact, immune to this divisive force. Why doesn't it mess things up, you ask? Well, it's because dark energy remains consistent. As space grows bigger, the density of dark energy remains steady. Imagine drawing a circle anywhere in space. 
taking note of the amount of dark energy there. Do it again after a billion years, and guess what? The amount of dark energy inside your circle won't change, even though space itself has expanded. That is, unless, of course, dark energy has a trick up its sleeve and proves to be more potent than a cosmological constant. All we know for sure is that it's something that drives the universe to expand more rapidly. Or to put it another way, it creates negative pressure. Now, negative pressure might sound odd. Pressure is usually seen as an outward force, right? But in the universe, it behaves differently. Pressure is a type of energy, like mass, that attracts rather than repels. All these calculations are what makes the Big Rip picture a slow unraveling movie. The first objects affected are the most massive, loosely bound structures, like giant clusters of galaxies. Their gravitational pull will start weakening, causing them to drift away into the growing cosmic voids. Next, we'd notice stars on the outskirts of our galaxy not following their usual paths, but instead drifting away, like party guests saying their goodbyes. The night sky would then start to dim as our Milky Way would gradually evaporate. The disaster would just accelerate from there. The orbits of the planet would begin to shift, spiraling outward. Just months before the end, after we've lost the outer planets, Earth would drift away from the Sun and the Moon from Earth. We would plunge into the darkness alone. The stillness of solitude won't last, however. Any remaining structure would be destroyed because of the expanding space. The Earth's atmosphere would start to thin. Gravitational shifts would cause chaotic tectonic movements. In the final hours, Earth would fall apart. Beyond this point, the destruction would continue unseen. Nuclei, the ultra-dense cores within atoms, would disintegrate next. Black holes' dense cores would get obliterated. In the last instance, space itself would just rip apart. Bad as it may sound, we may never rule out the threat of a big rip. However, it might take so long that all cosmic structures will have decayed before it happens. A rough calculation suggests the earliest big rip could be in about 200 billion years. Technically, the Sun still has about 5 billion years before it fades away naturally. So by the time this event might happen, our solar system would have long been gone. Nonetheless, Given the possible implications, scientists are placing a high priority on understanding the Big Rip. Let's be optimistic, though. I mean, if we look at the universe's history, we should consider ourselves lucky. We're in what cosmologists refer to as the Luminiferous Era. It means that right now, the universe is still pretty busy producing new stars, and we know how important these celestial bodies are for maintaining life as we know it. However, the golden age of star formation was about 10 billion years ago. Ever since that peak, the rate of creating new stars has been on the decline. Now, why is the universe taking this early retirement? It's not because it's lazy or tired. In fact, it's exactly because we're living in this expanding universe. For a new star to appear, a bunch of matter needs to be squeezed into a relatively small space. It's like trying to stuff all your clothes into a very, very small suitcase. As the universe expands, the matter is getting spread out, leading to less and less room in that suitcase for creating new stars. The Big Freeze, another theory related to the end of the universe, looks at this scenario. Stars will become endangered and then extinct species. This period of star decline is what astronomers like to call the degenerate era. It's estimated to start about 100 trillion years into the future. What will be left in the night sky at that point? Only the hardened workers of the universe, white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. White dwarfs and neutron stars, the remnants of medium and large stars that have exhausted their nuclear fuel, will eventually cool off and transform into black dwarfs. These black dwarfs are like invisible cosmic spirits, just hanging around without doing much, inert, and unseen. Other neutron stars, too heavy for their own good, will stumble under their weight and collapse into black holes. Further into the future, the universe will become a black holes only party. But even these cosmic weirdos can't cheat time forever. Black holes can fade away too. In fact, this idea of fading black holes came from a brilliant mind you might have heard of, Stephen Hawking. 
He suggested that black holes slowly shed energy in the form of radiation until they shrivel up like raisins and evaporate completely. Eventually, every single black hole will have evaporated, will be left with a universe in its twilight years, settling into its final age, aptly named the Dark Era. At this point, both light and matter will be nothing but distant memories. And then, well, nothing. If this big freeze theory is correct, the universe will just remain in a quiet, dark state, stretching into an eternity, where nothing else ever happens. Most of these theories seem to rely on the fact that the universe is expanding. But what exactly is it expanding into? We can't help but wonder if there's something else beyond our universe. Right now, this question is one for which physics doesn't quite have an answer for. We don't have enough facts. One suggestion is that time and space came to be with the Big Bang. That happened around 14 billion years ago, so logically there's nothing beyond the universe. However, a huge chunk of the universe is way out of our sight, existing beyond the part we can observe, which is about 90 billion light years in diameter. Because everything's pretty much the same wherever you look in the universe, we can presume that the bits we can't see would look pretty much like the parts we can. But that's just an assumption. Now, if the universe is infinite, there's nothing beyond it, right? I mean, that's just what infinite means. On the other hand, if it's finite and growing, you'd start to wonder if there's a boundary or an edge, like a universal cliff that separates our universe from whatever is beyond it. It gets even more complicated when you realize the universe has at least four dimensions, three for space and one for time. And it's pretty much impossible for us to picture what that might look like. Now, when we say the word universe, we're already picturing this vast space filled with stars, planets, and comets. Truth is, most of us find it hard to actually picture how large the universe is. Well, try to think of space as the biggest playground you've ever seen. Right now, our space playground goes on for 46 billion light years. It wasn't always like that. On that note, you've surely heard of the Big Bang Theory. Let's try to unpack it. Imagine the whole wide universe, every star, planet, down to the smallest particle, squished into a tiny, super-hot ball the size of, let's say, an apple. From that point on, we've got a pretty neat roadmap of how things unfolded in the cosmos. Dive even deeper into the universe's past, and things start to get a bit blurry. The energies and temperatures rise, and suddenly, our rulebook of physics doesn't make sense anymore. When we reach these early times, gravity, that force that keeps our feet on the ground, starts acting all mysterious. This is where we bump into the great puzzle of our time, quantum gravity. And here's the honest truth, we've still got some homework to do on that one. What made the Big Bang go pop in the first place? Well, it's kind of like asking what happened before the first page of a book. There's no page zero, or at least that's the answer that quantum physics provides. It tells us that there are events in the universe that just, you know, happen. It's not because we're not looking where we should, it's just how the universe works. Or at least, that's our current understanding of it. Right after the blast, everything was just a bubbly mix of gas, like this soda can that just got opened. This gas, which was mainly helium and hydrogen, began to stretch out and cool down. If we could time travel to those times, we'd see a younger, hotter, and cozier universe. Cool telescopes like the Hubble and James Webb let us peek into those ancient times. And what we see is fascinating. Earlier galaxies were like the cute photos of the universe when it was younger. Tinier, less heavy, and not as evolved as they are now. Over billions of years, the universe stretched out like a soap bubble. Imagine countless shiny marbles inside it, representing stars and galaxies. As the bubble grew bigger, the marbles spread out. Today, inside our bubble, we have trillions of galaxies. For every single galaxy we can spot, there are tons more we haven't seen yet. Some are too tiny, others are too far away. We still can't see them even if we use the fanciest telescopes available. Just to paint you a better picture, Know that today, our very own Milky Way is home to around 400 billion stars, similar to the Sun. It was a lot different in the past, though. 
Our galaxy began its journey like a little bundle of stuff, just a tad denser than most things in space. A lot of it was actually made of dark matter. Our closest star friend, named Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light-years away. To put that in earthly terms, it's like taking a road trip around our planet millions of times. It's also about the same age as the Sun. If we could have looked at the exact spot about 5 billion years ago, it wouldn't have been there at all. Many stars live together in groups, kind of like families. However, most are solo adventurers, experiencing the vastness on their own. When you zoom out from our Milky Way and peek into the larger universe, it's more, well, empty. Like a vast piece of countryside between big cities. In our cosmic area, we've got some cool neighbors. The Andromeda Galaxy, for instance, is just a stroll away, in cosmic terms, at 2.5 million light-years. And there are lots of smaller galaxies too, like the Triangulum Galaxy and the Large Magellanic Cloud. Our local hangout spot, which includes all these galaxies, spans about 3 million light-years. As we explore further, galaxies seem to gather in clusters, like suburbs. Connecting these clusters are threads of galaxies, creating a giant web in the universe. Galaxies are clustered this way because, just like magnets, they love to pull stuff towards them. If we could turn back time, we'd see a different picture. That's because throughout history, the popular galaxies with lots of stuff became even bigger, while the less popular ones gave their items away. From Earth, we can only see objects that are 46 billion light-years away at the most. If we put all this space into a giant box, its volume would be unimaginably huge. The main reason our universe is such a grand spectacle today is that it's been growing non-stop. Every year, its size increases a little more. In fact, the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. Sure, we can't feel it down here on Earth, but there are clear signs in the universe that it's happening. We're still not sure why the universe behaves like that, but scientists are working hard to figure out this mysterious expansion. Our understanding of the universe has changed a lot over the years, too. Back in the day, when our world had more trees than buildings, people from all corners of the Earth would gaze up at a twinkling sky above. For many, this sky was their roadmap, alarm clock, and spiritual connection point. Now, imagine not having a smartphone or a compass, and still being able to find your way home or knowing when to plant your crops. That's because our ancestors had the sky. They knew when it was time to take care of plants, navigate ships, or celebrate special occasions all by watching the stars and planets. Long ago, people in Babylon spotted some stars that behaved a little weirdly. These stars seemed to have a mind of their own. Obviously, we know now that they weren't stars at all. They were planets, like Venus and Mars, that sometimes wink at us down here. There was also a time when we believed the Earth was flat. Well, at least some people did, before Greeks in the 6th century BCE figured out that it's round. They even managed to guess its size by watching shadows in different places. They were pretty close with their estimations, especially if you take into consideration their limited tools. Now, speaking of our planet, there was also a time when humankind believed the Earth to be the center of the universe. We also believed everything else was just spinning around it. That was until a man named Copernicus did a bit of research and figured out it was actually the Sun coordinating all the movement in our system. And soon after, other thinkers and stargazers joined in on the fun, changing how we perceive the universe using new tools. Speaking of tools, thanks to a telescope, Galileo found out that Jupiter had massive moons tagging along. We call them the Galilean moons today in his honor. But the universe kept tossing surprises our way. Some people started cataloging stars, clusters, and nebula, while others found mysterious rays that our eyes can't see. And just when we thought we had it all figured out, Edwin Hubble, not the telescope but the man behind the name, discovered something amazing too. He realized that other galaxies are in fact moving further away from us. These days, we're looking at the universe in a different way. We know how the timeline works now. We know that our time here on Earth is limited. 
No wonder astronomers are eagerly scouting through the vastness of space, looking for planets similar to ours. There is no other planet that can safely accommodate us in our solar system. But we can use our neighboring planets and satellites for scientific purposes. Take Mars, for instance. In the following decades, NASA is planning to send all sorts of devices and even people up there. If the experiment proves to be successful, we might end up living there for a while, or at least use it as a pit stop for our next exciting destination. Now we all know that all planets are round. There are no square ones so far, and that's because of gravity. Well, roundish at least, as not all of the planets have perfect proportions. But did you ever wonder about the shape of the universe itself? Is it also round because of the same forces? Well, not really. Based on what information we have so far, the universe is actually… flat? According to the principles of general relativity, space has the ability to curve. This opens the door for the universe to have three potential shapes – a flat plane like a sheet of paper, a closed sphere like a bowl, or an open saddle-like curve. This isn't just a matter of academic interest, you know. The universe's shape has direct consequences on its ultimate destiny. One cosmologist from Princeton University explained it beautifully. The shape of the universe is a kind of map to its past and a predictor of its future. The questions of whether the universe will keep expanding forever or collapse at some point, and if it's finite or infinite, all circle back to the question of its shape. Now to wrap your head around this cosmic question, you need to understand two key elements – the density of the universe and its rate of expansion. Let's dig into this a little. Around 68% of the universe is made up of dark energy, while 27% is dark matter. <laughs> the rest, which is normal matter, if you'd like, makes up the stars, planets, and other cosmic bodies we're familiar with. When we talk about the density of the universe, we're referring to the quantity of normal matter packed into a given volume of space. Now, if the universe is denser, it also has more gravity. In this case, the gravitational pull can overcome the force of expansion, so the universe curls up into a sphere. This shape is known as the closed model, where the universe ends up looking like a gigantic cosmic ball. Imagine a world that's finite but without boundaries – a contradiction for sure. In this model, an adventurous explorer could travel forever through space, never bumping into a wall or falling over an edge. Alternatively, if the density of the universe is low and not enough to halt the expansion, then space distorts in the opposite direction. This results in an open universe with negative curvature that resembles a saddle. You know, like on a horse. Despite these two potential scenarios, most scientists agree that the density of the universe is just right. Which means it expands proportionally without curving. But what does it mean if the universe is flat? It doesn't mean we're living in an infinite sheet of paper. To understand it, consider these analogies. Imagine you're in a square room, walk 10 steps to the next corner, make a 90-degree turn, walk another 10 steps, and repeat this process twice more. You end up back at your starting point, completing a square. Add another dimension to this geometry, since we're not 2D creatures, and whoopee, you have a flat universe. This analogy wouldn't hold up in a curved space. If you have a terrestrial globe at home, you might find it easier to understand this next experiment. Start by placing your finger at the Earth's equator then trace a line to the North Pole, make a 90-degree turn, and return to the equator. Make one more 90-degree turn and walk back to your starting point. This journey only needed three turns, unlike the four turns in the flat universe scenario. Still struggling to understand? Here's another way to picture it. In a flat universe, two rockets traveling side by side will always remain parallel. This is in contrast to a closed universe, where the rockets will travel along the curb of space and eventually meet where they started. In an open universe with negative curvature, the rockets will gradually drift apart and never cross paths again. 
So is there a cosmological crisis at hand? It seems the answer to the shape of our universe is encoded in the cosmic microwave background, also named CMB, which is like the universe's fossil record. Over the past few decades, scientists have measured temperature fluctuations in the CMB to find almost no curvature, indicating a flat universe. Now, the concept of a flat universe is crucial to the standard cosmological model. However, in late 2019, scientists from a university in Rome published a paper arguing that current CMB measurements actually indicate we're really living in a closed universe. How did they figure this out? Well, they looked at how light behaves in the universe. Specifically, they analyzed how light bends because of the gravitational force of matter in its path. Either way, apart from this finding, there's nothing else that would suggest we're living in a closed universe. Most scientists believe this recent discovery is nothing more than a statistical anomaly. But if the closed universe theory turns out to be right, it would shift decades of astronomical findings. If the universe is indeed curved, it must be so large that the observable 93 billion light years aren't enough to reveal its curvature. It could be similar to standing in a fog, only able to see a small, flat patch of land. Yet somewhere out of sight, the horizon reveals that we live on a sphere. As we continue to probe the cosmos, we might find that the apparent flatness of our universe is just a small part of a much larger, curved cosmos. Its shape is just one of the many things we've yet to figure out about the universe. We can't quite put our finger on why the universe is even here, for instance. We do have some theories, but scientists are yet to be sure. It could be that the universe is like a pop-up, materializing out of an unstable nowhere land. Imagine the emptiest emptiness you can think of, suddenly churning out matter and energy in equal and opposite amounts that tally up to zero. For most of us, it's hard to picture that process. If we follow this theory, who's to say there's only one universe? We might be just one of an enormous collection, a so-called multiverse. For now, we'll just have to wait for the next wave of cosmic measurements to refine our theories. And for scientists to come up with hypotheses that aren't just mathematically pretty, but actually testable. Also. How could we possibly know all the secrets of the universe if we don't completely understand our own biology yet? I mean, if we did, we could, theoretically, solve all of our health problems, right? We might even be able to play around with our DNA, like this molecular Lego, and give ourselves naturally purple hair or red fingernails. Well, time for a reality check, as we're still struggling with this one too. Here's a great example, our microbiome. Our bodies, home to 10 trillion human cells, are also an active city for 100 trillion microbial cells. That's a couple of pounds of bacteria and other microbes, which we absolutely can't do without. They've set up shop in our bellies, lungs, noses, and every other hidden nook and cranny. We're like luxurious cruise ships for these tiny microbial tourists, and we still don't fully understand the implications of this symbiotic relationship. There are still a lot of things we don't know about planet Earth, either. We've only ever dipped our toes into Earth's crust, never venturing more than a few miles deep. Everything else is our best guess, from remote sensing and smart physics. Believe it or not, it took us an embarrassingly long time to accept that the Earth's crust is constantly shifting, like Jenga pieces. We only warmed up to plate tectonics in the mid-20th century. We're also still trying to figure out precisely how the planet's inner engine works, and how the swirling, conducting materials in the outer core create our protective magnetic field. Plus, with 4.5 billion years of geological chaos, we're sometimes better off studying meteorites or the surfaces of other celestial bodies for clues about our planet's history. Even our faithful companion, the Moon, is a bit of a mystery. Was it born from a colossal collision or some other event? We're still not sure. But hey, the fact that we still have a lot to learn is what makes life interesting, isn't it?
That, and the thrill of actually finding an empty parking spot in San Francisco. Or maybe even your city. We've never sneaked a peek beyond the edge of the observable universe. What lies there? If we managed to get there, would we find another universe? What if the universe we live in is just one of billions of trillions of other universes? I'm talking about the concept of a multiverse now. Look, there's this idea of parallel universes. Let's take one of them. It looks exactly the same as our universe, and still, some details differ. Maybe instead of becoming a doctor, you chose to start a music band there. Maybe one infamous asteroid changed its trajectory, and dinos are still roaming Earth in that universe. But the multiverse theory takes it all one step further. Those who believe in it state that there might be countless realities. According to this theory, we live in a bubble that is just one of many other bubbles, which, I guess, looks like bath foam. These bubbles constantly bob up and vanish. Multiverses are described by a few scientific theories, which mention various possible scenarios, from separate universes that keep springing into existence all the time, to regions of space that are in different planes than our home universe. But there's one thing these theories agree upon. All of them suggest that the space and time we observe is not the only reality. You see, it's impossible to explain all the quirks of our universe if it's the only one to exist. So it's either inventing newer theories that can throw light on certain properties of our universe, or accepting the fact that we're living in just one of many, many universes, all of which are different. One of the most widely known multiverse theories is called inflationary cosmology. This is the idea that right after the Big Bang, the universe expanded rapidly and exponentially. Indeed, cosmic inflation does explain lots of the properties of the universe we observe. For example, the distribution of galaxies. When this theory was suggested for the first time, it was perceived as a piece of science fiction. But it can indeed explain tons of interesting features of the world we live in. So with time, people started taking it seriously. Now, the theory states that inflation might happen again and again, maybe even infinitely. And this could create constellations of bubble universes. Of course, none of these bubbles will have the same properties as ours. There may easily be places where physics as we know it doesn't exist. But even though some of these universes might look like ours, they all lie beyond the realm we can observe directly. Another theory, called the Many Worlds Interpretation, claims that there might be multiple branching timelines, or alternative realities. And in each of those realities, our decisions play out differently, which also means very different outcomes. At the same time, the only reality you can perceive is the one where you live. If it's true, then the question is, where are all those other universes? Well, they most likely all overlap in dimensions we absolutely can't access. And at the moment, it's not possible to travel between universes. But who knows? Maybe a few thousand years later, people will not only find a way to prove that parallel universes exist, but also invent a method to hop from one of them to another. Unfortunately, so far, there's no solid evidence that multiverses exist. All the proof we've got today is purely theoretical. Some experts even argue that it could be an unbelievable cosmic coincidence that the Big Bang created such a perfectly balanced universe as ours. Or, if parallel universes do exist, we might have just inhabited the one that had all the right conditions for our survival. It's still unclear whether the multiverse theory is even testable. Perhaps we just haven't thought of the right tests yet. Now, I've got one scary thought for you to consider. What if, at one point, you stopped existing in your home universe, the one you were born into? What if your consciousness was transported to a parallel universe, where you're now watching this video? Think of this. What if someone told you that life actually creates the universe? We're all used to the fact that the universe exists outside of us and was created with the Big Bang. But what if, in reality, it's us who create, not just houses and cars, but the whole world? Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Well, let's discuss this fascinating theory. For centuries, there's been one way of thinking about the universe. It's brought us amazing discoveries and inventions that have changed our lives. But guess what? This model might be running out of steam. Scientists say that the universe was created from the Big Bang, 
Then, it was just a bunch of lifeless particles bouncing around, until they started creating stars, then planets, and finally us. The current model is logical and well thought out, but the problem is it's still full of unexplained things. For example, it can't explain how life came to be in the first place. Sure, we can understand how life evolved and changed over time, but the real mystery is how it all began. When exactly did we humans become conscious? How do a bunch of molecules in a brain create our thoughts and experiences? That's a real head-scratcher. And even if we put the life and consciousness stuff aside, the current model falls short in explaining the basics of our universe. We know about the Big Bang, but where did this Big Bang come from? How can something come from nothing? It's a great puzzle, and we don't have the answer yet. Well, here comes Dr. Robert Lanza and his wild idea called biocentrism. In 2007, he wrote a scientific article about how biology could join forces with quantum physics. It was so cool that two years later, Lanza and his friend Bob Berman wrote a book that expanded the ideas from the article. So what does Lanza actually believe? Well, he basically says that everything we perceive is within our minds. That everything, the whole universe, is all in your head. Of course, this idea isn't new at all, but Lanza tries to combine it with astrobiology and quantum physics to explain how exactly life creates the world instead of the other way around. His theory says that biology is the boss of the universe. He thinks that if scientists want to come up with a theory of everything, they need to start with biology as the foundation. According to him, our consciousness plays a big role in how we see the world. Space and time aren't real things, but more like how our animal brains understand stuff. Lanza also says biocentrism helps explain a lot of quantum paradoxes and puzzles. He even thinks that it might be a better way to bring all of physics together than Einstein's famous theory of relativity. So, let's take a look at seven important ideas in biocentrism. The first one says that reality is connected to our consciousness, and what we see depends on us looking at it. We've got this idea that the universe exists on its own, even when we're not looking at it. If you have the kitchen in your house, the kitchen is always there, right? Well, not exactly. Our eyes capture tiny packets of light, but the real perception of colors, shapes, and movement happens in the back of our brains. Everything we see is because of light bouncing off objects and interacting with our brain. So without our brains, the kitchen would be just a bunch of random particles. In other words, when you're not in the kitchen, there's no real kitchen there. It's just a bunch of possibilities, like a shimmering swarm of matter and energy. It's pretty challenging to think about, isn't it? But to truly understand the universe, we need to go beyond our habitual ways of thinking. We need to embrace a viewpoint that's simpler, yet more demanding than what we're used to. We need to look at the world in a whole new way. Next, the second and third ideas say that particles behave differently when we watch them. Sounds creepy, right? But it's actually true. We observe this phenomenon many times in many experiments in quantum mechanics. Yes, particles actually change their behavior if they know they're being observed. It gets even crazier. Some particles can even instantly influence each other, no matter how far apart they are. It's like little atoms have a secret connection that defies space and time. This is why Lanza believes that bringing the observer into the picture, like us humans with our thoughts and perceptions, can help us understand things better. He thinks that the observer is the missing puzzle piece that can help us find a way to bring all the laws of the universe together. The fourth idea says that consciousness is super important, and without it, things get all fuzzy. Like we said, everything is intertwined, and there's no separate universe out there that's not connected to living things. Biocentrism suggests that the external world, everything we see, actually depends on us, the biological creatures. We're not just passive observers with clear windows to the world. In fact, without us interacting with the world, it's like the universe isn't really there. Just like the kitchen disappears when we're not there, and the universe is all about how we experience it. 
Reality is a dance between us and the world. It's a whole new way of understanding everything. The fifth idea points out that the universe seems to be just right for life to exist. There are over 200 things in the universe that have to be just right for life and consciousness to exist. If the Big Bang had been even slightly stronger, everything would have zoomed by too quickly for galaxies and life to form. That means no us! And if the forces of nature, like gravity, and the strong nuclear force were tweaked even a little, atoms wouldn't hold together, stars wouldn't ignite, and we would be left with plain vanilla hydrogen everywhere. Of course, there's many theories on why this could be the case. We could also look at this phenomenon the other way. It's not that things were made this way specifically for us, but our existence is a result of things being this way. We're just the result of particle movements and certain conditions. Biocentrism, however, has a more fun way to look at it. Life creates the universe. The universe and its parameters are a reflection of the logic of our existence as living beings. And finally, the sixth and seventh ideas say that space and time are not things, but tools our animal brains use. Think about it for a moment. Does time really exist? Well, the reality of time is a bit shaky. According to biocentrism, time is simply our way of making sense of the world, a tool for understanding. It's not some external force. Our mind weaves together snapshots of information, creating the illusion of time. So when we perceive time passing, it's just our human perception at work. And what about space? In our daily lives, we think of space as a vast container without walls. But in reality, space is full, not empty. There's no fixed measure of distance anywhere. You believe that you're far away from your kitchen, but everything around us is just a bunch of atoms almost without any empty space in it. Well, there you have the basic ideas of biocentrism. In his books, Lanza explores these ideas very deeply and tries to answer philosophical questions, like if death is just an illusion or if plants are aware of things. They even talk about whether machines can ever become conscious. Some people aren't sure if this theory can be proven right or wrong. Unfortunately, there's no way for us to test it right now, but Lanza hopes that in the future we can do cool experiments, like huge quantum superposition thingies, or either prove or disprove his theory. Until then, it's more like a cool idea than anything. No matter which theory you prefer, one thing is clear. We live in a truly peculiar world. So let's keep exploring it and discover new amazing things. Empty space is not really empty. At least, that's what quantum field theory says. It's actually filled with tiny vibrations that can turn into virtual particles if they have enough energy. These virtual particles can produce packets of light with low energy called photons. Now, there's something every black hole has. An event horizon. It's a point of no return. That means once something crosses that point, it can never get away. Not even light. And there's an insanely strong gravitational force around the event horizon. Black holes survive by gobbling up gas and stars around them. In most cases, a black hole has a swirling disk of material that surrounds it, called an accretion disk. It glows brightly as all those things that come too close to an event horizon get heated up and torn apart before the black hole swallows them all. As material comes closer, it starts to travel and move faster and faster, going all around the black hole. This makes the accretion disk glow and, at the same time, outlines the shadow of the black hole, which is basically the very event horizon we're talking about. Black holes might even want to hide, but they do so awfully badly. According to Einstein's theory of general relativity, gravity bends and warps space and time. It means that the closer you come to this extremely powerful gravitational pull around the black hole, the more twisted space and time around it become. That's what Stephen Hawking was talking about nearly 50 years ago and it doesn't stop there. He also suggested that if these particles find a way to escape a black hole, they steal some of its energy. And because of these thieves, the black hole loses its energy as time goes by until it, at one point, completely disappears. He suggested that black holes release energy in the form of thermal energy or heat, which is called Hawking radiation. 
And this radiation doesn't carry any information. It means that when a black hole evaporates, it destroys all information it had about the star that created the black hole. That way, we can't know what really happened. And it's kind of confusing because the laws of quantum mechanics say the information can't be destroyed. This conflict is something we call the Hawking Information Paradox. According to Hawking, all this information isn't really lost, but is stored in a cloud of all those zero energy particles that surround the black hole. He called that soft hair. Now, there's this new study as a possible solution to this paradox. Maybe Hawking radiation is non-thermal. Instead of just releasing plain heat, it's possible the black hole sends out a message in the form of radiation. This message contains important information about the black hole's past, the stars that formed it, and other details we thought were lost forever. It's like a secret code that tells us all about the history of the black hole. But let's go back to Hawking's theory, where a black hole can eventually disappear. It says that not only black holes produce Hawking radiation, any object with enough mass can. Researchers actually studied a process called the Schwinger effect too. It's when an electromagnetic field creates strong distortions and in that way forms matter. They applied this idea to Hawking's theory of black hole radiation. What they found is that the radiation Hawking predicted can actually be created in places with different levels of gravity, not just around black holes. Here's the key. When there are massive objects, like stars or planets, they create a curving effect on space and time. This curving is there because of their strong gravity. Even if you're far away from a black hole, there's still some massive object somewhere around that creates the curving of space, which can make you feel like you're in that twisted space. It can create radiation, similar to what happens near black holes. It means that not only black holes can slowly evaporate, other massive objects in the universe can also lose their energy in the same way. If this is true, the energy of everything in the universe will slowly be drained away in the form of light particles. That means everything and everyone, including stars, planets, black holes, and us, share the same destiny and will all eventually fade away. This sounds scary at first, but even if this theory is true, it's not going to happen anytime soon. It would take way longer than the current age of the universe for a supermassive black hole to completely disappear. So, in the way we measure time, black holes are basically eternal. And stars could last even longer since many black holes formed after some giant star collapsed upon itself. Some others belong to a group called primordial black holes. Hawking, who became famous for talking about black holes, mentioned those ones as well. And the theory says they probably formed spontaneously in the early universe, not long after the Big Bang happened. Hawking realized that primordial black holes could have different sizes, from very light to very heavy. Really small ones would have disappeared by now because of Hawking radiation. There's a pretty cool idea that these primordial black holes could be dark matter. It's a mysterious substance that scientists think exists in the universe. It doesn't give off or reflect light, so we can't see it directly. Scientists think dark matter might explain why stars and galaxies move in strange ways, but we still don't have the tools yet to confirm whether these black holes really exist or if they're actually made up of dark matter or not. Hawking also explored the idea that our universe is just one of many universes. It's a concept called the multiverse. Some scientists believe it could be that any situation you can imagine in your life is happening somewhere in some other universe. Hawking didn't agree with that, so in his final paper, he proposed a new mathematical framework that made the multiverse finite instead of infinite. This means that there would be a limited number of universes rather than an infinite number. Another thing that's hard to test and prove, but at least he left us with something to think about. Believe it or not, time travel is not that impossible according to the laws of physics. Scientists have equations that suggest we could have something called closed time-like curves that might allow us to go back in time. Imagine going back to the most embarrassing moments of your life. Knowing what would happen, you could avoid them. But here's the tricky part. 
Going back in time could cause some big problems. It could create situations where things would happen in a way that doesn't make sense. Imagine you're walking down the street and meeting your younger or older self, or accidentally changing things that have already happened. Hawking was talking about this part too. And these are all things that made him concerned about time travel. He made a guess called the chronology protection conjecture. He suggested there might be a rule of nature that stops time travel from happening because it could create all these strange and confusing situations where we would just go back, fixing our wrong decisions rather than living in the present. Until we discover traveling through time without causing such disruptions, I guess all we're left with are life lessons and learning from our mistakes. In his last years, Hawking talked about the future of humanity and we still don't know if he was totally serious. He mentioned a special particle called the Higgs boson that could cause a big bubble that could gobble up and eventually even destroy the universe. He also mentioned things like beings from other planets coming to Earth and conquering us or robots becoming smart enough to take over the world. Some of his ideas turned out to be true and time will tell if it will be the same with the others. What will the end of the universe be like? It might be 100 billion years away. But here's the real question. Should we start panicking already? Jan 11, a cosmologist, appeared at a recent screening of the captivating Netflix documentary, A Trip to Infinity. She mentioned that there would be a time when the last sentient being exists and the last flicker of thought fades away. This perspective sheds a whole new light on things. Somewhere in the vast expanse of the universe, there will be a moment when the memories of legends like Einstein and Elvis will fade away. Just imagine what that last thought would be. A brilliant pearl of wisdom. A colorful expletive. The possibilities are as endless as the stars in the night sky. Now let's take a cosmic detour and explore how we got ourselves into this peculiar predicament. As we currently understand it, our universe burst into existence with a bang approximately 13.8 billion years ago. Since then, it has been expanding at an ever-increasing pace. For decades, astronomers debated whether this expansion would continue indefinitely, or if a big crunch awaited us in the distant future, where everything would collapse back together. Everything changed in 1998 when astronomers stumbled upon a discovery. The cosmic expansion was accelerating. This turbocharged expansion was fueled by a mysterious force called dark energy, woven into space-time's very fabric. The larger the universe grows, the more this enigmatic force pushes it apart. It's eerily similar to the cosmological constant, a concept introduced by Einstein to explain why the universe didn't collapse, only to be discarded later as a blunder. But guess what? The cosmological constant turned out to be a stubborn idea that refused to fade away. And now, it poses a threat to both physics and the universe itself. If dark energy triumphs in the end, distant galaxies will eventually speed away from us so rapidly that we won't be able to see them anymore. With each passing moment, our understanding of the universe will diminish. Stars will extinguish and never ignite again. It will be akin to living inside an inverted black hole where matter, energy, and information are swallowed beyond the event horizon, lost forever. The star-making days of our universe are behind us. Star formation reached its peak nearly 10 billion years ago and has been gradually declining ever since. The reason for this waning of stellar light is our expanding universe. As the cosmos grows larger with each passing day, the matter within it remains constant but gets spread out over more and more volume. To create a star, matter must be compressed into relatively small volumes. As the universe ages, fewer opportunities arise for such compression. So, in the far future, we can estimate that the last star will be born approximately one trillion years from now. This final star is likely to be a small red dwarf, a fraction of the mass of our sun. Red dwarf stars have extraordinarily long lives, slowly burning through hydrogen in a steady fusion reaction. But eventually, even they will exhaust their fuel. In roughly 100 trillion years, the last flicker of stellar light will fade away. 
This accelerated expansion will progressively limit our view of the wider universe. Although we can still observe distant galaxies because of the light they emitted long ago, their current light will never reach us. As the universe expands at an increasing rate, the boundary beyond which galaxies recede from our view moves closer and closer. One by one, galaxies will be torn away from us by the relentless cosmic expansion, accelerating so swiftly that their light will forever elude us. Anything not gravitationally bound to us will be unable to withstand this onslaught. Only the local group, consisting of the Milky Way, Andromeda, Triangulum galaxies and several satellite dwarf galaxies will remain in our proximity. However, this lingering existence will be far from idyllic. Over time, our three galaxies will merge into one mega-galaxy, completely isolated from everything else in the universe. In this solitary state, the mega galaxy will slowly dissolve. Chance interactions will scatter individual stars, or what remains of them, into random orbits. Some will be hurled into the giant black hole at the center of the galaxy, while others will escape into the void, never to be seen again. After an unimaginable span, no complex systems will endure. All that will be left are isolated islands drifting in an infinite expanse of darkness. To make matters worse, as thinking requires energy, there will eventually come a time when the universe lacks the energy to sustain a single thought. Eventually, all that will remain are subatomic particles, dancing in the vast expanse of intergalactic space, engulfed by eternal darkness. This will occur trillions upon trillions of years after the last glimmers of light and life have vanished. And then, countless eons will stretch onward to the point where even measuring the passage of time becomes impossible. As Brian Greene described it in his book, Until the End of Time, it's a tale full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. This might make us feel some sort of weight of insignificance in the face of this cosmic destiny. If this truly is the fate awaiting the universe, it's both humbling and disheartening. Our universe may be 14 billion years old, but that's just a fleeting moment compared to the unfathomable darkness that lies ahead. It means that everything remarkable in our universe occurred in a mere blink at the beginning, followed by an eternity of emptiness, its finality and futility on an unimaginable scale. But hold on a second. Before we surrender to despair, let's remember that we're still a long way from this inevitable end. New discoveries in physics could provide a glimmer of hope, an escape hatch from this fate. Perhaps dark energy is not constant. Maybe it will change its course and bring the universe back together. Michael Turner, the brilliant cosmologist who coined the term dark energy, emphasized that the cosmological constant would be the least interesting answer to the dark energy puzzle. So, who knows what surprises the future holds? But for now, we can't help but peer into the abyss and wonder. We are but brief inhabitants of this cosmic spectacle, here for the grand party when the universe brims with life and light. We may not have a say in the final act, but we can cherish the here and now, reveling in the magic of the present. As astrophysicist and philosopher John Archibald Wheeler once said, the past and the future are mere fictions, existing only in the artifacts and imaginations of the present. From that perspective, the universe ends with each of us, granting us a unique perspective and a chance to make our mark. So let's embrace the fleeting nature of existence. Though the future may be finite, it liberates us to fully appreciate the wonders of this moment. After all, as the saying goes, nothing lasts forever, whether it's the stock market, the stars, or even our own lives. An awareness of eternity's whiff can illuminate the brilliance of a lifetime, even if it's just mine or yours. There is more than one theory about how the universe is going to be gone forever. In the world of quantum field theory, for example, we come across something called a vacuum decay. Picture it as a vacuum that's kind of stable, but not totally rock-solid stable. This false vacuum can hang around for quite a while, chilling in its semi-stable state could eventually say, nah, I'm done, and transform into a more stable vacuum. We call this wild event false vacuum decay. 
It's like a cosmic game of Jenga, where the unstable blocks finally collapse, and the universe finds its true balance. So, cosmic adventurers, let's treasure the Milky Way and all its splendor for as long as it lasts. And who knows, maybe in the vastness of this ever-expanding universe, there's still a surprise or two waiting for us. The story isn't over yet, and the cosmos is filled with secrets waiting to be uncovered. What do you think the end of the universe looks like for us humans? Are we even going to be around to witness it? There's this mysterious thing in space, an unusual spot that scientists haven't been able to explain for more than 15 years. There are different theories, and one of them says that maybe this is an imprint from a collision with a parallel universe. Is this true? Well, let's see. Take a look at this map. This is the map of our universe. Well, not really. This is actually the map of cosmic microwave background radiation, or simply CMB. Many, many billions of years ago, there was a big bang. It was so powerful that it created our entire universe. And of course, such an event couldn't occur without leaving some consequences. And these consequences are literally everywhere. The Big Bang left electromagnetic radiation, which we know as CMB. We don't notice it in our daily lives, but it's literally here, under our noses. And if you had some kind of superhuman vision, you would see how everything around you shines with this dim light. This radiation is very important. If we hadn't discovered the CMB, we would never have found out about the Big Bang. Previously, scientists believed that the universe had always existed. There was no beginning and there was no end. It sounded pretty ridiculous to us now, but less than a century ago, people were absolutely sure of it. Stephen Hawking was one of the first scientists to guess that the universe did, in fact, have a beginning. The guy was so cool that he realized this as a student while working on his doctoral dissertation. But unfortunately, he had no proof. If there was such a strong bang billions of years ago, then where are the traces? Where's the proof? Laughed people who believed in the eternal static universe theory. But don't worry, they had the proof rubbed in their faces real soon. In 1965, astronomers Arno Pienzas and Robert Wilson discovered CMB, and that was the first grandiose proof of the Big Bang. It turned out that radiation was everywhere. We just didn't notice it. In fact, at first, Pienzas and Wilson themselves mistook it for the noise of a big city, or pigeons, or something else. For their discovery, which turned the world of science upside down, they received the Nobel Prize. All right, so people learned that they were surrounded by electromagnetic radiation. Then they started collecting more data about it. They accumulated more and more info over the years until they made this very map. This is a map of CMB temperatures. But while creating it, scientists discovered something unusual. Let's take a look at this map. It looks like a large and diverse pattern of cold and warm places. But in reality, our universe is quite uniform. All temperatures on this map are close to negative 455 degrees Fahrenheit with very little difference. All temperature fluctuations between these places are small, and each tiny speck actually spreads over millions of light years. So everything in our world is pretty calm and stable, except for one point. This cold spot right here. Astronomers first discovered it in 2004. First, it looked like nothing unusual. It's just a region where the temperature is below average for a couple of microkelvins. But remember, we're not talking about a small area. This is a giant cold region. It's literally billions of light years in size. Wait, the scientists thought, this can't be true. The universe should be consistent everywhere. According to our standard model, this cold spot simply shouldn't exist. But it does exist though. This isn't just some mathematical error, it's right there. So what is this cold spot, and how did it appear? Astronomers have been trying to find the answers to these questions for years. 
Even now, we have only a few theories. So let's discuss them all. Theory 1. Cosmic Texture This idea was brought up at the end of 2007. Then scientists suggested that this cold spot could be the hills of space. In other words, it may be a bumpy region of the universe, just part of its texture. But that's a silly explanation, so this theory was quickly discarded. Theory 2. The Supervoid This hypothesis was considered the most plausible for a while. It stated that the cold spot was actually the so-called supervoid. It's a terrifying, dark place of our universe with almost no galaxies. And because it's an empty region with almost no stuff in there, it seems cold to us. However, this theory was refuted in May 2017. After carefully examining the cold spot, scientists found out that there were no signs of a supervoid there. Moreover, voids and supervoids, which actually exist by the way, are still very small in size. The cold spot is literally thousands of times bigger than them, so there must be some other explanation. And there is one, perhaps the most bizarre of them all. Theory 3. A Parallel Universe This controversial idea was put forward by cosmologist and theoretical physicist Laura Mersini Houghton. She suggested that the cold spot could be an imprint from the collision of our universe with a parallel one. Standard cosmology cannot explain such a giant cosmic hole, says Mersini Houghton. This is the unmistakable imprint of another universe beyond the edge of our own. Her assumption is based on the theory of the multiverse. This theory says that there's actually an infinite number of universes like ours in the world. They constantly collide with each other, giving each other a push which creates a new Big Bang. So maybe the cold spot is a bruise from such a collision. For quantum mechanics, such crazy theories are pretty common. But for standard physics and our simple understanding of the world, this is earth-shattering. Of course, we need strong evidence. And Mersini Houghton's team has begun to work on it. Professor Tom Shanks from the Center for Extragalactic Astronomy at Durham University also participates in this research. The craziest sounding of the exotic models for the explanation of the cold spot, the multiverse is actually the most standard in terms of our current model of the universe, he wrote in one of his works. So, what evidence do we need? Well, our cold spot is located in the southern hemisphere. According to Shanks, if there really was a collision between two universes, we should find another cold spot, and it should be in the opposite northern hemisphere. If astronomers actually found it, this theory would be confirmed, and it'd become the first proof of the existence of a parallel universe. But it's not that easy. To find a second spot, we need the latest, highly sensitive telescopes. We also need to find out some info about the nature of dark energy, how it affects space, and, in other words, there's still a lot of work to do. Not so long ago, scientists actually believed they had discovered the second spot. Researchers from New Mexico thought they had found it in the Northern Hemisphere. But unfortunately, this is likely to be a mistake. The map these researchers used had a high measure of randomness, so it's possible that their discovery is just an accident caused by other voids. So, basically, we haven't found another cold spot so far despite careful analysis. But again, even the best modern equipment is not perfect, and it doesn't mean that there's no second spot. It just means that we haven't found it yet. But if one day we did find it, it could change the world of science forever. We'd confirm not only the theory of parallel universes, but also the famous string theory. It could explain everything that occurs in our world. But if this happens, we'll get even more questions than we already have. How did these two universes collide? How does it all work? So far, it's all just guesswork. We can't claim that the cold spot is a print from the collision of parallel universes. But we can't refute this either. Actually, we may never know the truth at all. But it's still interesting to strive for it. Incredible news has recently spread across the internet. NASA has discovered evidence of a parallel universe. But is this actually the truth? 
Well, there is a grain of truth in this story, but it's not that simple. Let's consider it. Perhaps you've seen the articles that said NASA has finally found a parallel universe. The story was widely publicized, and people got divided into two camps, those who took this news at face value and those who considered it all complete nonsense. But both sides aren't exactly right. Let's start from the beginning. The discovery was made by NASA's ANITA. This name stands for the Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna. Yeah. It was designed to study neutrinos. Neutrinos are high-energy cosmic particles. They're incredibly small, lack any charge, and have almost no mass. Trillions of such particles pass through our bodies every second, and we don't even notice them. All because they almost don't affect ordinary matter. That's how insignificant they are. On average, in our entire life, each of us gets affected by a maximum of one neutrino. So basically, hunting neutrinos is like hunting ghosts. To catch them, you would have to send a whole stream of these particles through a giant piece of lead, and it has to be trillions of miles thick. At the same time, you have a 50-50 chance that you'll stop one of them. Therefore, in order to detect them, scientists had to come up with some clever tricks. We know that neutrinos, like other similar particles, come to us from outer space. Ooh. They travel to Earth from the Sun, stars, and even from the Big Bang itself. Some of them come to us from particularly big sources, such as black holes, supernova, pulsars, and even from various unidentified objects. Some of these particles have particularly high energy. And for scientists, these neutrinos are the most interesting ones. But oddly enough, most high-energy neutrinos don't actually come to us from afar. They form right here, next to Earth. This process has a cute name, particle shower. Well, this is how you can explain it in simple words. A granny particle gets into Earth's atmosphere. Usually, it's a particle with very high energy. Then, it generates several children that have less energy. Each of them then makes more grandchildren, whose energy is even less than theirs, and so on, until we have a giant family tree of low-energy particles. In the end, there may be billions of them. During this process, piles of neutrinos are created. Then, they begin to sink deep into our Earth. During their journey through the planet, they touch the upper layers of its crust, or ice. For example, Antarctica's ice. When faced with all these obstacles, they create radio pulses. And as you might have guessed, these are the exact radio pulses that scientists are trying to find. It may be a surprise to you, but Antarctica is pretty deserted, you think? And that's why it's the best place to study microscopic particles, which usually can barely be traced. There won't be any interference or anything like that. We can catch these pulses with the help of powerful antennas. NASA places these antennas on balloons that can rise as much as 20 miles above Earth's surface. That's how they've been tracking these neutrinos for the past years. All right, now we know what Anita is doing. But what about that parallel universe stuff? Nah, don't worry, we're getting there. In 2018, Anita began receiving abnormal radio signals that caused quite a stir in the scientific community. Remember how neutrinos come to us from outer space and then gradually sink deep into our planet? So recently, Anita has discovered neutrinos that didn't descend from space as usual, but rather rose up from Earth. In other words, these particles, called tau neutrinos, basically travel back in time. But how is this possible? Scientists began to research them. At first, they thought that maybe it was a detector error or an error in interpreting the data. But no, everything was correct. Something very exotic was happening. If so, then first we must try to find a simple explanation. What if these tau neutrinos just came to Antarctica from some other source? Maybe they came to Earth from the other side and somehow passed through the boundary. To test this theory, scientists decided to seek help from another cool neutrino observatory called IceCube. Yes, very cool! This observatory is located near the South Pole. It consists of 5,160 optical detectors buried in ice, and all these powerful detectors are designed to detect neutrinos. Anita researchers were like, hey guys, we found some strange radio signals. Could you please check where they come from? 
No problem, Ice Cube replied, and started their research. And as a result, they found nothing. Yep, Ice Cube didn't detect any signal sources at all. It turned out that these strange particles had basically appeared out of nowhere. How could this be? Scientists tested many different theories, but none of them could explain the situation accurately. Later, Ice Cube published an article which basically said, nope, we have no idea where these signals came from and how to explain them in terms of the standard model of the universe. Oh, now it's getting interesting. So what on earth are these signals? Having exhausted normal explanations, scientists began to consider ideas that go beyond our understanding. One of them said that perhaps these particles had come to us from a parallel universe where time flows in the opposite direction. This crazy-sounding theory is the result of the famous multiverse theory. According to it, about 14 billion years ago, when the Big Bang happened, two twin universes were born. One of them was ours, and the other was a parallel one. And they're almost identical in everything, except for some things. For example, time in this parallel universe doesn't move in the same way as it does in ours. It moves backward. Besides, everything there would look upside down to us, as if we're looking in a mirror. Therefore, scientists call it the antiverse and believe it could be filled with antimatter. And even though all this may seem strange and crazy to us, for those who live in that antiverse, their way of life would be quite normal. In fact, they would rather find us, the strange ones. So these mysterious neutrinos could be born in this antiverse. Let's say they somehow existed there and then accidentally got into our world, where we were able to detect them. The idea of the multiverse itself is really incredible. If it's true, then it may mean that there is an infinite number of realities, many of which are much better than ours. Quantum mechanics even says that it's quite possible that every second of every day, any of your decisions divides the universe into two. And so there are quintillions of parallel universes where our lives have gone very differently. Something like this is hard to even imagine. Of course, it would be great if we could find a way to get into another universe, and if these mysterious tau neutrino particles were able to cross the boundaries of two worlds, well, maybe we can do that too? But unfortunately, this phenomenon alone isn't enough to say whether the multiverse theory is true or not. This is just one of several possible options. At this stage of human development, we cannot prove or disprove this theory. Maybe someday in the future, we'll find out the truth, but definitely not now. The only thing we can say now, after this discovery, is that we've found strange radio signals which standard physics can't explain. So we need to move in this direction and study them to learn more about this incredible phenomenon. But people like to dream about space, so no wonder we've gotten so excited about this. And it would be great if one day it turned out that this theory was actually true. The theory of parallel universes has been popular in various movies and books for a very long time. Where would you go if you found out that you could travel between realities? Me? i look for a different reality of ice cream. <laughs>
the Big Bang Theory. And here it is. Nothing has ever been anywhere because neither when nor where existed. Do you get it? But actually, no. There was one thing. It was the so-called cosmic singularity. A state of our universe in which it was incredibly small, dense, and very hot. Imagine if our universe was compressed into a small ball. The pressure and temperature inside would be enormous. At some point, it became impossible to withstand them. And here comes the Big Bang. It was an outburst of energy and matter that created everything we see now. Time and space, basic physical forces. It also scattered quarks everywhere. These quarks, tiny particles that make up our world, were all boiling in an incredibly hot cosmic broth. When it cooled down, gravity began to attract them to each other. They gathered into atoms, then molecules, and then into the first objects into the world, stars. And all this happened just some 12 to 14 billion years ago. All right, now we know how our universe was created, but what was before that? Alan Harvey Guth, an American theoretical physicist and cosmologist, has devoted his whole life to solving this mystery. After learning about the Big Bang Theory, Guth found some flaws in it. For example, the distribution of matter was very even, although it shouldn't have been. Let's hang a balloon filled with paint to the ceiling and lay a white canvas on the floor. If we drop the balloon down, it will burst and we'll see absolute chaos on the canvas. A bunch of spots scattered everywhere randomly. Neither is like the other. But that's not really what the universe looked like. Instead of throwing a colored ball from the ceiling, let's draw a small red dot on the canvas. Now, let's expand it a little more, and more, and capture this all on frame-by-frame -frame shooting. We'll see a circle gradually growing in all directions. That's the reality. The early universe was very even and proportional. That was Guth's discovery, the theory of inflation. Here's what it says. Even before the Big Bang, there was some kind of force that could give the bang a strong acceleration something that was able to distribute everything in space instantly and evenly. Guth's theory was a success, and now most scientists rely on it. For most of them, this idea of the birth of the universe is quite enough. For most, but not for all. Martin Bojewald is a German professor of physics, and, in his opinion, the universe was born quite differently. Remember when we talked about cosmic singularity? the state of the universe in which it was small, infinitely dense, and super hot. According to Martin's theory, the singularity couldn't just appear out of nowhere. This is nonsense. But then, where did it come from? Let's look at a pendulum on an old clock. The pendulum rotates back and forth. Its movement is smooth, continuous, and non-stop. This is how we usually see time. It flows and never stops. But quantum time, ho ho, quantum time doesn't work that way. It's more like the second hand of a clock. It consists of small segments and makes short pauses. And just like with the second hand of a clock, the beginning of one segment of time is always the end of another. See what I'm getting at? Let's go back to balloons again. According to the Big Bang Theory, once upon a time, our universe began to expand, inflate like a balloon. But sooner or later, it will blow away back. The universe will start shrinking and return to the state of cosmic singularity. And then guess what? The Big Bang 2. Nothing appears out of nowhere and disappears into nowhere. According to Bojewald's theory, the beginning of each universe is the end of the previous one. Our universe is not at all the first and not the last. Millions of similar universes existed before us and will exist after us. This theory, although it sounds very logical, is far from complete. Unfortunately, we don't have enough knowledge to find all the evidence for it. So for now, all this is just a hypothesis. But some people come up with even stranger ideas. 
Scientists promote such unusual theories that no one could even think of. Neil Turok, a South African physicist, and his colleague, Paul Steinhardt, an American theoretical physicist, look for answers far beyond our universe. They say that yes, our universe isn't the first one. There have been and will be an infinite number of them. And not only will there be endless Big Bangs, our universe is just one of an infinite number of others. And all of us are stuck in a cycle of endless rebirths of parallel worlds. This sounds incredible and frightening at the same time. But how does it work? According to this theory, our universe is located inside a so-called brain, as in membrane. In other words, we're stuck in some kind of elastic surface that's capable of contracting, stretching, oscillating, and so on. Like pieces of fabric on a rope, these parallel universes are located near each other. Each one has a neighbor. We're not the exception. Another universe may be an inch from ours, but we can't see it. That's because there's a tiny space between us, and this tiny space contains the fourth dimension. How do these universes originate? Through brain collision. These brains are getting closer to each other very, very slowly, until one day they finally collide. Their collision creates two big bangs and two parallel universes. Then they're moving away from each other. The created worlds continue to live. We're currently at this stage, but when they disappear, the brains collide again and this will lead to the birth of a new universe. Remember the inflation theory? There was a mysterious energy that pushed and accelerated the Big Bang. Well, if we did collide with another universe, that would explain everything. Of course, everything described here is a great simplification. When you hear that our world is some piece of fabric on a rope, it sounds like complete nonsense. But this idea is based on string theory and M theory two giants of quantum mechanics. If they turn out to be true, they could explain almost everything in our universe. Creating a theory is an incredibly huge process. Turok and Steinhardt made a huge amount of calculations and swept away many, many non-working theories. Also, to work this out, they have to overcome the limits of the human mind and think in 11 dimensions at once. Unfortunately, this crazy and elegant idea was laughed at. Turok and Steinhardt say that scientists are regular people, just like everyone else. They're also afraid of change and the unknown. And it's really scary to question everything we once believed in. Many years ago, people didn't believe that the Earth was round. Then they were outraged by the Big Bang Theory. We can't make discoveries without struggle and fear. That's why Turok and Steinhardt don't plan to give up so easily. After all, the evidence that we have now only says that each of the three theories is equally possible. So which answer is correct? We may never know, at least not at this stage of human development. Unfortunately, as long as we have no evidence, we can only theorize. But maybe one day we'll find something that will open our eyes once and for all. Maybe one day we'll solve the mystery of how our universe came to be. Thirteen point eight billion years ago, a mysterious explosion happened in space. It was chaos, a time when the stars, planets, asteroids, the rest of the space bodies, and galaxies were born. It was the Big Bang, a theory we all know about. But no one knows for sure what happened, where the universe came from, and what was there before. Some even think the universe went through a cycle where it contracted and expanded several times. In 1991, a cosmologist from Stanford University named Andre Linde had submitted an article with the main idea that there was a possibility the universe had been created in a laboratory. His theory said there was a chance an advanced civilization somewhere out there had created our universe. This civilization has made an entirely new cosmos that later evolved its own planets, stars, and intelligent forms of life. 30 years later, Many scientists take this theory pretty seriously. They even started talking about things that we, as a civilization, can do to get to such an advanced level. 
The theory says this advanced civilization decided to add technology that helped to create a new universe out of nothing. It happened through quantum tunneling. It's when an atom can appear on the opposite side of some barrier, even though it's supposed to be impossible, considering the laws of physics of our world. Like if you wanted to pass a tall wall, but you can't pass it with ladders or go around somewhere. Imagine you can just walk through it like a ghost. In our world, it's not possible, but a more advanced civilization perhaps can do it. Plus, they realized how they could create new universes. Right now, on the cosmic scale, we could be a class C civilization. We don't know how to recreate some things. For example, conditions on the Earth for when our central star, the Sun, goes out. If we manage to become a class B civilization, we'll learn to adjust conditions to be independent of the Sun. That means we might be able to learn how to live even without it. And if we level up and become class A, we'll know how to recreate cosmic conditions and produce our own cosmos in our laboratories. We think of the world we live in through three dimensions of space, east-west, north-south, and up-down. There's also one dimension of time, which means we can distinguish past from future. A fifth dimension would represent one more extra dimension of space. The theory of its existence was first mentioned in the 1920s. It was inspired by the theory of gravity by Albert Einstein, who said space-time is warped by matter and energy. We can't perceive these four dimensions, but we see how an object moves and attribute it to gravity. And maybe there's some other force, like the electromagnetic force, that's more than 1,000 times stronger than gravity that could explain things going on in that extra dimension of space. The fifth dimension is curved in a way we can't see it, but the idea about it was mentioned in a string theory. It considers the universe as really small strings of mass energy, not as particles. They vibrate in 10-dimensional space-time, considering six dimensions are rolled up way smaller than a single atom. That led to the picture of the universe as a 3D island that floats in 10-dimensional space-time. Also, the fifth dimension might be an excellent explanation to tell us more about dark matter. That's the invisible stuff with a mass, but we can't see it, nor can it interact with ordinary matter. And dark matter is 85% of all the matter in our universe. The universe can't be still. It's constantly in motion, either contracting or expanding. We used to think there were 100 billion galaxies, but it turns out there are more than a trillion. The galaxies are moving away from each other. This is what it means when scientists say the universe is expanding all the time. There are voids between galaxies that sometimes stretch millions and millions of light years across. They can seem empty, but they can also contain way more matter than we can find in galaxies. Still. Stars usually can't be formed there because the matter between those areas has lower density. But there are still plenty of so-called intergalactic stars. A good example is the Virgo galaxy cluster, 10% of which are intergalactic stars. We don't know how exactly they got there, but there are two possible ways. One, stars can collide, merge, or pass close to another galaxy, which can kick it off from its parent galaxy. Option number two, a supermassive black hole can accelerate a star to very high velocities if they have a close encounter, which can, again, make a star be expelled from its parent galaxy. If you could have a giant magnet, you could even pull something out from the vicinity of a black hole. That's possible if the magnetic field near a supermassive black hole is as strong as the black hole's gravitational field. But it doesn't work if we're talking about material that's already beyond the black hole's event horizon. That's a spot with a gravitational force so powerful, not even light can get away. You'd need to accelerate this material to the speed of light, at least, to get away. For that, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. But a magnet could help if something's heading toward the black hole but didn't get inside yet. When someone mentions a black hole, you might get a picture of some giant void in space but the Milky Way is most likely full of thousands of smaller black holes that float around the galaxy. When a star comes to its end, it will destroy itself in a supernova explosion, which is a cataclysm of energy. In that explosion, the densities in the core will reach an intense enough state that nothing will be able to escape. At the same time, the major part of the star explodes outward, 
but a part of it collapses inward, creating a black hole. The bigger the star, the bigger the hole. The black hole then swallows everything that comes in its way, including other stars as well. When a star gets sucked up into the black hole, it's ripped apart because of the strong gravity inside the black hole. Some of its parts fall into the black hole, while others get ejected at incredibly high speeds. Some black holes might have been formed in a different way. The early stages of our universe were, to say the least, pretty chaotic. It had high temperatures and pressures, and was in a state that shaped the entire cosmos. Under the right conditions, any old gas patch may have shrunk itself to become a black hole. And they came in many different sizes, from something that weighs a couple of pounds to giant masses like thousands of suns and those in between. They aren't really black. Black holes are areas with strong gravity and no object can escape when it gets inside. They feed off electromagnetic radiation such as light and space particles. Since they're consuming matter all the time, black holes give off a dark glow. The Earth is not that close to the inhospitable edge of the solar system. We're the sixth planet from it. Scientists made a pretty cool 3D map of our solar system where we can see what the edge looks like. It took them 13 years to design it. The boundary is called the outer heliosphere. It marks the area in space where the solar wind, which is the stream of charged particles our sun emits, gets deflected and draped back by the radiation coming from the empty region beyond our solar system. The inner layer of the heliosphere is where the sun and the planets have a rough shape of a sphere while the outer layer is not that symmetrical. This asymmetry happens because our sun is moving through the galaxy and goes through friction with the radiation in front of it. This is our home planet Earth and its satellite, the Moon. Zooming out, and here's our solar system. A bit more, the Milky Way galaxy. And we're a small dot among an infinite number of stars. Now, even farther out, a cluster of galaxies dots and swirls in the endless space. Further, there's Laniakea, supercluster. That little dot here is our galaxy. Moving on, Hydra Centaurus supercluster. Huge clusters comprising thousands of galaxies are no more than a speck from here. Next, Pavo Indu supercluster. This is an area 200 million light years wide. We can zoom out until we see the entire observable universe. Each little dot in here actually contains thousands of galaxies and quadrillion stars. Scientists speculate that our universe may look like a bubble, and that bubble might collide with another universe. Yes, other universes could exist. Actually, even a whole infinite number of those. All of them could have appeared after the Big Bang. The collision between them isn't impossible either. At least, it might have happened before. And the proof is here, in the direction of the constellation Eurydinus. This place is called Uranus Supervoid. It's about 1 billion light years wide. By comparison, the width of our entire galaxy is only about 100,000 light years. There's absolutely nothing in this place, and it may be a trace from an old collision between our universe and another. Scientists think they were passing by each other. When the distance between them was minimal, the gravitational forces of the bubbles began to pull toward each other, just like two drops of water trying to connect when they're close. But the speed of the universes was too high for them to continue interacting. So the other universe just tore out a piece of our bubble. There might have been about 10,000 galaxies in that void, and all of them were either destroyed or taken over by the other universe. Let's travel to the edge of our universe to see how this collision might have taken place. We're 10 billion light years away from our home. Here, in another galaxy, we see amazing nebulae of different colors and shapes. And if you look in the other direction, there's a huge wall moving at us. All these bright sparks on it are enormous galaxies about to collide with us. But in fact, it's a humongous mirror that only reflects our universe. Here, space-time is distorted and begins to be pulled into another universe at a tremendous speed. The usual law of physics may simply stop working at this point. Gravity may disappear, and with it, all the stars would explode and people on the surface of planets would hang in weightlessness. But if the universes didn't go at a tangent but crashed directly into each other, things would be much scarier. The enormous amount of collision energy would probably cause an incredible explosion. Its force would simply destroy everything in our bubbles. Still, the two bubbles might begin to merge, too. 
At first, all galaxies at the edge of the universes would be torn apart. But then, the merger would begin. The galaxies would start moving chaotically. They would fly past each other, break apart, collide, and explode. The collision of two galaxies is an accident of enormous proportions. And it might happen to our home quite soon, in space terms. The Andromeda galaxy is heading our way. It's a spiral galaxy about twice the size of ours. And there are about a trillion stars there, which is twice more than in our Milky Way. At the very center of this bright galaxy lurks a dark beast, a black hole. Its weight is two and eight zeros of the sun's mass. Red giants hundreds of times larger than our sun. Pulsars emitting enormous amount of energy like spotlights. Rogue stars and many large and small black holes. This soup of dangerous objects is moving toward us at 68 miles per second. A trip to New York to Los Angeles at that speed would only take half a minute. The disk of Andromeda can already be seen with the unaided eye on moonless nights. As time goes on, it'll get even bigger. As Andromeda gets closer to us, its gravitational force will begin to stretch the arms of our spiral galaxy. It'll begin to unwind. The stars and planets will lose their orbits. One possible scenario is that an unknown asteroid, or even a dwarf planet from the Andromeda galaxy, will crash into the Earth at an incredible speed. Our planet will explode just like a balloon from this impact. Oh, goody. Another option involves stellar collisions. Our Sun would face another star. The bigger star will slowly begin to consume the smaller one. First, it will steal the light upper layers from it, and then it will eat it just like spaghetti. Or even like rigatoni. When a large star reaches its critical weight, it will burst. This explosion will destroy everything around it, including our solar system. Perhaps the shockwave will even reach other neighboring stars. Yet another scenario is that our solar system will be thrown into dark space. Imagine a tennis ball tied to a rope. You take the rope and spin the ball over your head like a sling. Then you let go of the rope and send the ball flying. This is what will happen to the sun and all the planets around it. We'll find ourselves in dark and cold space. But life on Earth will not be affected. We'll still have our bright star to keep us warm. The only disadvantage is that all the stars in our night sky will disappear. And the most likely possibility is that the merger of two giant galaxies will have no effect on us at all. The thing is, the distance between stars and planets in space is enormous. So they can all just mix together and form one giant cloud. It would be like shoveling fine sand through a big sieve. The objects won't interact with each other. But the most interesting thing will happen to the black holes in the centers of our galaxies. Right now, there's a dense cluster of stardust and stars around them. As Andromeda and the Milky Way come closer together, they will begin to dance with each other. Gee, will it be the twist or the foxtrot? And when the black holes get close together, they'll begin to swallow all matter around one another. Billions of tons of colored stardust, asteroids, and star particles will fly toward the very center of either black hole. It might seem like this process happens very slowly, but it's an illusion. Super heavy objects like black holes warp the space-time grid, so time is much slower near black holes. And all objects that seemingly stay on the event horizon for weeks or even months are actually long gone. When the black holes finally come together, they merge into one supergiant black hole. But its mass is slightly less than the combined mass of the two dark monsters. Some of their weight is transformed into collision energy. This energy is released so strongly that its waves can be felt in other galaxies. Now, a huge black hole gathers all this dense and hot core of the two galaxies around itself. At some point, the black hole feels full and throws out powerful jets of energy into space. This is called an active galactic nucleus. It's one of the brightest phenomenon in the universe and the most powerful source of electromagnetic radiation ever known. These jets may be more than 5,000 light years long. By comparison, the distance from Earth to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is only 4.2 light years. And the explosion that accompanies the jets has the power of 100 supernova explosions. Wow, blows my mind. The blast wave from this event could even reach the edges of a new galaxy, and this outburst would be visible from millions of light years away. 
Now, there are dense clouds of multicolored dust at the center of merged galaxies. The weight of these clouds is so great that they begin to shrink and take on a round shape. Gradually, they become so heavy that they compress the core and nuclear reactions start inside them. The temperature begins to rise and soon, boom, there's a supernova. It's a veritable fireworks show at the center of the galaxies. Stars erupt from the fog and form new hot worlds. At this point, the arms of the two galaxies that were previously pulled out slowly return to their former shape. The super-heavy center of our galaxy has such a gravitational force that it affects stars and nebula hundreds of thousands of light-years away. The galaxy's arms twist again, and we see the new and finished galaxy, the Milkomeda, or Milkdromeda. Hey, how about the andro milky Meda way? Blah blah blah. Well, that's hard to say. Black holes tearing apart enormous stars. Pulsars spinning at incredible speeds and emitting powerful beams of energy. Colorful nebulae with fireworks of newborn stars. Galaxies of every possible color and size. All of these are found within our universe. But it's not infinite. It has a boundary, a literal wall. And beyond that, there's an absolute nothingness. Right now, we're going to make a journey to that wall. But first things first, our universe is like a humongous nesting doll. If you open it up, there's a smaller one inside. It's a galaxy. Inside that is an even smaller doll. That's our solar system. And the smallest doll of all is the Earth. Each of these dolls has boundaries that we're going to cross. For that, we'll need a spaceship and a big one. It also has to be able to move a hundred times faster than the speed of light. You get on board and start the engines. 62 miles above sea level is our first boundary. That's 10 times higher than passenger planes fly. This point is called the Kármán line. It separates the atmosphere of the Earth from outer space. Now we fly further to the edge of our solar system. We turn on the hyperdrives and fly past Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We've traveled a distance of 100 astronomical units. One AU is the distance from Earth to the Sun. And here's the boundary of our solar system, the heliosphere. Here, the speed of the solar wind decreases rapidly. First, it drops from 620,000 miles per hour to the speed of sound. Then, there's a layer called the heliopause. This is where the wind almost vanishes. And then, our ship experiences a bow wave. This is where we feel the force of the interstellar wind, which collides with the boundary of our solar system. When you pass this boundary, you find yourself in the dark of interstellar space. And here, you can find two human-made objects that made this trip for the first time in history. They're Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 1 crossed that boundary in 2004. Voyager 2 did it in 2007. These space probes discovered that the heliosphere is not a perfect ball around the sun. Its southern boundary is 10 AUs closer to the star than the northern one. So, we're moving in interstellar space and will soon approach a stone wall around our solar system. 200,000 AUs further, and there it is. This wall of rock is the Oort cloud. In fact, it's a pile of asteroids that surround our world. Scientists speculate that the Oort cloud could be the source of comets and meteorites that fall to Earth, but they're so sparse that we easily fly between them. Now we're in complete darkness. The Milky Way is about 106,000 light years wide. In a conventional rocket, it would take billions of years to fly across that distance. But you throttle to the max. You masterfully fly past the stars and planets as if on a racetrack. And within minutes, you're at the edge of our galaxy. There's no more interstellar wind. All you see are bright dots somewhere in the distance. These dots are huge galaxies. We need to look at a map to make a route to the edge of our entire universe. You're here, near the Milky Way galaxy. It's part of a cluster of galaxies called the Linnea Kea Supercluster. But even this huge thing is like a little street in a big city. Zooming out, we find Hydra Centaurus Supercluster. Thousands of galaxies on the map look like little dots. Maximum zoom out! This is our entire observable universe. We thought it was infinite but we may have proof that it has a boundary. It's here, 10 billion light years away from our home. Even if you travel at the speed of light, a trip there would take twice as long as our whole planet has existed. 
during that time, the sun will either fade away or explode like a supernova, destroying our entire solar system. And if you can live that long and then return home, you will see that our galaxy is there no more. It's long since collided with the Andromeda galaxy and merged into one big cosmic body. Luckily, your ship is able to warp space-time so that this journey will literally take a few seconds. Boom! Congratulations! You've arrived at your destination, the Eridanus Supervoid. Some scientists believe this location is the evidence of collisions of our universe with something big enough to leave such a large scar. The Eridanus Supervoid is an empty and cold space one billion light-years wide. If you think of this void as a cup, it would fit at least 10,000 galaxies, and it appeared after an accident of gigantic proportions. The object that crashed into our universe was… another universe! Yes, other universes may actually exist. Imagine that our entire universe is a huge bubble that contains all the clusters of galaxies in the observable universe. There could be an infinite number of such bubbles. They could have been born during the Big Bang. These universes may be different from ours. They may have other galaxies and nebulae. But these bubbles could also be parallel universes. This means that if you chose cereal over oatmeal in the morning, in another universe, your twin would choose the oatmeal. Every choice you ever made in life had completely different consequences in a parallel universe. And because the number of choices are infinite, there's a whole infinity of parallel universes. So, like a regular bubble, our universe has a wall that is near the Eridanus supervoid. Long ago, another bubble flew past ours. As they approached each other, their gravitational fields began to interact. Our boundary wall began to deform and pull toward the other universe. The same thing happened on the other side. Then the walls of our universes came into contact. But as these bubbles moved, their connection began to break, and the other universe just ripped a huge chunk of ours. A cold void was formed at the point of collision, and that was the Eridanus supervoid. The problem is that the universe looks the same to the observer, regardless of point of view. For example, imagine a basketball hanging in the air. Now if we put an ant on the ball and tell it to find the edge of the ball, it will start running around it, making an infinite number of circles. But the landscape around the ant will not change. All it will see is a rounded horizon. That's because the ball remains the same from any point of view. The same thing happens to us when we try to find the edge of our universe. All because we imagine the world in three-dimensional space, and our view is limited. For example, you see an ordinary square in two-dimensional space. But if you add depth and change the point of view, voila, it's a cube. If we could see the universe in four-dimensional space, a square might be something completely different. But maybe we can leave our home bubble. The key to traveling to another universe might be inside a black hole. A black hole is one of the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy, they warp not only space, but time as well. It's like putting a heavy boulder on a net. The net will sag, and the closer you get to the boulder, the stronger the curvature is. Once you're in the gravitational field of a black hole, you can't leave it. We still don't know what might actually be in the heart of a black hole. Some scientists speculate that white holes also exist. Theoretically, they should be born along with black holes. Except for the color, they're the exact opposite of black holes. Nothing can come close to a white hole. At the moment, there's no data on such objects, but general relativity theory suggests they do exist. There's also a theory that a black hole may be a passage to another universe. When you get into a black hole, you can come out the other side through the event horizon of the white hole. So you bypass the boundary of the universes and find yourself in a completely different world. But we may have proof that a white hole exists. In 2006, scientists discovered an unusual burst of energy somewhere 1.6 billion light years away from Earth. This burst was unique. It didn't look like a supernova explosion or even the merger of two black holes. Some astronomers believe it was the birth of a white hole. But because it was unstable, it was destroyed almost immediately. This process was reminiscent of the birth of our entire universe, the Big Bang. So, scientists called it the Little Bang. Bang. 
That's how it all started around 13.8 billion years ago, and was figured out over the past 100 years. Everything we see in space today – planets, asteroids, comets, stars – it wasn't there at the beginning. In the 1920s, astronomers came up with the idea of how a long, long time ago, the universe was just a single point – an extremely hot, like trillions of degrees hot, compact, dense point that stretched and expanded unimaginably fast. Matter that started flying in all directions at the speed of light at one particular moment. The Big Bang was complete chaos, with teeny tiny particles that were mixed with energy and light. Yes, a total mess, but still, in the first minute after the Big Bang, the base for everything that would later appear was almost finished. It was hot only during this huge blast. As soon as the expansion started, the universe began to cool down, similar to when gas cools when you spray it from an aerosol can. During that process, part of the energy kind of froze out, just like the water freezes into ice. Here, pure energy got frozen and solidified into matter. One minute after the bang, the cooling thing was still going on, extremely fast and literally everywhere at once, since the universe really doesn't have edges. It wasn't just a compact dot anymore. The base for further expansion and all that's coming was being formed. Remember those tiny particles from that first boom stage of the universe? They started grouping together, which formed atoms of helium and hydrogen. It took about three minutes for most of the helium and all of the hydrogen in space to be made. These two are the most common elements and the basic materials that later form the first galaxies and stars. Just because the base wasn't finished doesn't mean the creation of the universe stopped after those first couple of minutes. True, after that, no new elements were created for millions of years, which is why the initial version of the universe was entirely helium, hydrogen, and energy. But eventually, atoms began to slowly group together, which, after lots and lots of time, caused the creation of galaxies and stars. Clouds of helium and hydrogen grouped and turned into stars that had gravitational forces. Our Sun is also made of three-quarters hydrogen, while the rest is helium. Uh, one quarter? Yeah. At later stages, some other, heavier elements started to show up too, such as carbon, iron, oxygen, and so on. It wasn't all about chemical processes where new elements, stars, or planets kept coming. The whole universe has been expanding ever since the Big Bang. Researchers realized other galaxies are kind of moving away from ours. Hmm, guys, you need to stop doing that. How will we discover alien life out there if you keep running away all the time? And not just that. The farthest galaxies are actually moving quicker than the ones closer to our galaxy, the Milky Way. The universe is fabulous, unknown, mysterious, scary, and completely silent. Imagine yourself floating in your spacesuit somewhere above Earth. All you can actually hear is the sound of your own breathing. Nothing from out there. Since there's no atmosphere, sound doesn't have a way to travel or be heard. Speaking of spacesuit, that thing costs around $12 million. I guess that means we'll have to wait up a little bit more to try that whole chilling in space thing. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, so you might think it's the hottest one too. And yet, Venus actually takes the title of the hottest planet in our solar system, with the surface baked by a temperature of 840 degrees Fahrenheit. Fair enough. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, which is in charge of regulating temperature, so it loses the race for the title of the hottie of the solar system. Venus also has pretty long days. Just one takes around 243 Earth days. Now that comes in handy for those people with pretty long to-do lists who like to take it easy and slow. However, Venus orbits the Sun in 225 Earth days, which means one year there lasts 18 days less than a Venus day. Hmm, you can have two birthdays in one day then? Well, two birthdays in a day could be one of the good sides, but the downside is that on Venus, it rains sulfuric acid and snows metal. Eh, not so fun anymore, huh? The Earth is cool itself. Being 4.5 billion years old and the only known planet that supports life, it also has more trees than there are stars in the Milky Way. 3 trillion, while well, there are only 100 to 400 billion stars. We may have counted trees, but still, so little do we know about our ocean. 
only 5% of it is explored. So we know less about it than about Mars or the Moon, whose surfaces have been fully mapped. It's funny how outer space is just 62 miles away from us, counting from above sea level on our planet. Seems so close, I sometimes go that distance just to have my breakfast. And yet, only 5% of the universe is visible from Earth. 68% of it is dark energy, while 27% is dark matter, which we can't see with a telescope. So close, yet so far. We will always see the same side of the Moon no matter where we are on Earth. The Moon rotates on its axis at the same speed it orbits the Earth. This is called synchronous rotation. Sunsets on Mars are blue. That happens because the fine dust on the red planet has the size perfect for blue light to efficiently penetrate the atmosphere of Mars. So the blue light scatters, after which it stays closer to the direction the sun goes, unlike the light of other colors. The universe is full of wonders, and one of them is a planet made of diamonds. Yay! It's twice bigger than the Earth, and scientists believe it's mostly covered in diamond and graphite. Now to get there, you might probably need that $12 million spacesuit, together with a really expensive ship. But if, and that's the keyword here, you manage to go there and back, you may even easily pay it off. Scientists also have some predictions as to the end of everything. Oh boy, ready for this? At its early stages, the whole universe was dense and compact, so it was really, really thick. But after around 400,000 years, it kept expanding, which made it more transparent. All of this encouraged releasing light we know today as the cosmic microwave background, or CMB. It's like if you turn your TV on an empty channel and switch off the cable, you'll see the static black and white dots moving on your screen. There's something like the CMB, and also an afterglow of all that energy that was released during the Big Bang. CMB is still here. Astronomers can see it through the microwave telescope. Expanding never actually stopped. The universe is still spreading every second at an unbelievable speed, causing all the objects in space to move away from each other all the time. How repelling! We know it because the Sun from other galaxies appears redder than it's supposed to be. This is called redshift, and it happens when the source of light moves further from the one who's observing it. Then there's gravity. It attracts all objects in the universe to each other, which is the reason why planets keep orbiting the Sun or why our solar system orbits the center of the Milky Way. It's why we stay on the ground, while in space we'd float since there's no gravity up there. Having all this in mind, scientists got the idea that one day the universe will simply take the opposite direction and start shrinking back, which will be known as the Big Crunch. Whether this really happens depends on the type of our universe. If it's open, it'll keep expanding and nothing will ever stop it. But over time, as it's stretching, the density will become so low, galaxies won't be able to form new stars, and the existing ones will fade away. When space loses all the light and heat, life won't be possible. The universe will just remain as a cold beyond, which will keep spreading thinly into endless darkness. Mm. And then, big crunch or not, bang, it all disappears. Hey, good thing we have billions of years ahead of us, huh? Well, maybe you. I won't be around then. <laughs> I'm going to retire. <laughs>